You're watching BCTV. We're all about Brantford. You're watching BCTV, Brantford Government Television, a service of Brantford Community Television. This program is brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. meeting of the Brantford Planning Zoning Commission order. It is Thursday, June 17th, 2021. I have 7.08 p.m. We'll start by introducing members of the commission and staff. Uh, commission member John Lust. John, are you here? Uh, John Lust, present. present. Uh, Fred Russo. Fred, are you here? Present. Present. Fred Russo. Fred Russo. Joe Bayuso. Joe, are you here? Joe, are you here? Joe Bayuso here. Marcy Pelosi, Marcy, are you here? Are you here? Marcy's here. Maybe Joe Vayuso could mute. So we don't have the reverb. Of the reverb. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Massimo, Massimo Ligori, Massimo, are you here? Yes. M yes, Massimo is here. Great. And uh, I am Chuck Anders, chair. The our staff this evening, our town planner Harry Smith. Barry, are you here? Uh, Harry Smith here. Our assistant planner, Evan Brining. Evan, are you here? Here. And our clerk recording secretary, Michelle Martin. Um, we have a number of items, public hearing and other items, but before we get to that, uh, one of the things we wanted to talk about is where, uh, because it may come up during this meeting, we may continue this. And uh, we got to figure out where, how we are proceeding going forward, where our next meeting is going to be. Um, is it going to be remote? Is it going to be in person? Those are basically the options. And uh, we did talk about that a little bit last time. Uh, I think there was, there were some pros and cons. I think the general consensus was maybe it would be good to get back to in person. Although there are certainly advantages of doing remote stuff in terms of looking at your computer and there's other health and safety issues. Um, that said, uh, Harry, you can help me with that. My understanding is that in terms of legislation, the, the there was not a bill passed in the regular, the, the, the present uh, governor's executive order expires at the end of the month. So unless the legislature passes a law to extend things, uh, that uh, it, you don't have a choice. We have to be come back in person. There was a proposal to extend it to April. There were option of a remote hearing through April, uh, but that did not get through the legislation. And I think that included a proviso that the physical location and electronic equipment must be made available to the public 24 upon request, 24 hours in advance, and that members of the public must be able to attend in person if a quorum of the commission attended in person. So I, I don't know, uh, I don't know where things stand. I think the session ended. Uh, I don't know if this got passed. <laughs> I just don't know. And I don't know if the governor's going to sign it. Um, so my, my interest, so the safe thing is you have in-person meetings uh, going for, for July and then see what happens. And maybe we have the option of having remote meetings. Um, maybe we, we, we do it um, once a month or something. And I think Fred had suggested, why don't we just do per, in-person in July and then reevaluate again? So that's a possibility, but um so that, that's my understanding where things stand. It's, is that I, I don't even know if remote is, is technically still is an option. And if we do, we do have to have some technology, electronic equipment available to the public if they want to participate in that way. 
I think. I'm not even sure if that's still part of the bill. I don't even know. Anyway, that's my understanding. Harry, what's your understanding? Um, pretty much the same as Harry Smith Town Planner. Um, my understanding is nothing happened in the legislative session in terms of a bill actually being adopted by both chambers and signed by the governor. It got through the House onto the Senate, and it did not get acted on in the Senate. Um, I understand there's some language in what's called the implementer bill that implements the budget. Um, I am not um, you know, well-versed in how things happen after the end of the session, but I think that bill typically goes through. Um, I think it goes through by the end of the month, but it might be very late in the month. So I think absent any authorization now um, to plan ahead for July, the safest course is to have a regular in-person meeting under the statutes that'll be, you know, back in effect on July 1st, the day of the meeting. And I think given the fact that we need to, um, we'll need to advertise any public hearing for a meeting on the 15th um, before the meeting on the 1st, by the end of June, um, I think probably we need to commit to two in-person meetings uh, in July, the July 1st and July 15th. And then we can reevaluate and see what has happened, if anything, in terms of legislation and granting authority for the commission to do things other than in person. Because right now, at the end of the month, as you mentioned, there won't be any authority unless something else happens. Uh, Chuck Anders here, thank you, Gary. So with that, what do people think? Uh, John, what do you think? I'm okay with uh, meeting in person in July. I think it's probably what we're going to have to do. Right. Great. Thanks. Uh, Chuck Anders here. Fred, thoughts? I agree with John. I would let's meet uh, in person July. <laughs> Joe Uso. Yeah, I agree also. I think we should meet. Okay. Marcy? Um, I'm happy to meet in July. I'm just wondering if, if people are away or if they're scheduled, could we leave the option of still Zooming, you know, coming in via Zoom? Um, I think that requires technology that I don't know if we have available. In other yeah. Words, I, I, you know, and I'm not sure the, I'm just not sure. I mean, it could be entirely legal. I think in the past in other states, I have uh, had commissioners participate by phone call um, as long as it was a conference call and you could hear. But again, that's a little problematic and that things happen visually that that person can't, you know. Uh, I guess care. I'm wondering if there's a way to, you know, be present, but also perhaps have a Zoom component where you could share your screen if there are people at home. Yeah, I just don't know this. My understanding is not authorization to have kind of a hybrid meeting right now. Okay. Um, we can look into that, but I think in terms of having a, we definitely have to have, I think, a physical location. So if we're continuing a hearing, then it's got to be a place and a time definite. And mm -hmm. that would have to be the firehouse at seven o'clock on the 1st of July. And then right. um, if there's any component we can add to that that becomes apparent in the meantime, we'll let everyone know. But, yeah, uh, Harry raises, I, I've been involved in meetings where there have been pre-COVID in-person meetings where someone participated by phone. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, so that may be possible, I suppose, where you could have a commission member um, participate, but we would have to have a speaker on, on you know, at the meeting or something where you could speak. Right. You know. And, and maybe you could look at BCTV or something for visuals or, I mean, there may be some way, but I, I just don't right. know technology wise. Well, yeah. yeah and I'm I, also thinking about somebody who might be homebound, you know, well, yeah, that, I mean, who might yeah. want to participate. Yeah. That, well, that, that's more the hybrid thing. I mean, right. the part, even uh, the, the hybrid thing is where can you have public participation if they're not present? Uh, yeah. And, I mean, it might open us up to, some legal issues that we're not aware of. So, I mean, my suggestion would be probably to not do that until we fully understand what the ramifications might be. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah. So we, we can evaluate on, on that. Um, yeah. Massimo. Is that? Uh, should be a co-host. Should be able to unmute. Yeah, there he is. He's back. I'm back. You can hear yeah. me. Yeah. All right. So. So last week I was uh, really, I think I was for more in person meeting and, um, and I walked to the atmosphere I'm at right now and I'm like, wow, 
I feel good and I'm in a good spot. So, so this would be pretty cool. Uh, you know, sitting here being in our meetings and, uh, but you know, either way I, I'm up for anything guys, you know, okay. I just well, love where I'm at right now that, you know, <laughs> right. No, they, I, they, there are certain conveniences, uh, you know, if there's poor weather and driving and you could, you know, get multiple screens. I, I don't think there's any problem with bringing a iPad with you if you wanted to look up, provided you're not, you know, you're just looking at record items or something. I mean, it's going to be clear what you're looking at. It's going to be a matter of record. So, so okay. So it sounds like July then is going to be in-person meetings and we'll evaluate that. And those meetings are July 1st and the 15th. Is that correct, Harry? Harry Smith Town Planner, yes, that's correct. And then sometimes we end up, because our next meeting is not till September, although it's, I think it's early September, if we sometimes we have to have special meeting because we would go like a month and a half without a meeting. So, so that, that's a, that could happen, but we'll see. Okay. So with that, then that's, um, that's what we'll do. We'll have the uh, in-person meetings for our July meetings and evaluate at that point. With that, then we'll go to our, perhaps our secretary can read our notice of public hearings and, um, Marcy, can you do that? Sure. The Planning and Zoning Commission of the Town of Brantford, Connecticut, hereby gives notice of public hearings to be held on Thursday, June 17th at 7 p.m. by remote technology as authorized by Executive Orders 7B and 12B to consider the applications listed below. Information regarding how to participate in the public hearings will be provided on the meeting agenda that will be posted on the town's website at least 24 hours prior to the meeting. One, application number 21-4.8, special exception for grading, section 6.8, for the construction of a single family home and septic system located at 96, 102, and 104 Stony Creek Road. DiMartino Development and Construction, LLC, care of Dominic DiMartino, applicant and owner. Item, item number two, application number 21-4.7, special exception for grading section 6.8 for upgrades at 45 through 55 and 46 through 52, Alex Warfield Road, the Trolley Museum, Brantford Electric Railroad Association, Inc., care of John Proto, applicant and owner. Item number three, application number 21-5.10, special exception for a two-family dwelling located at 8 Sfay Avenue, Joseph Lepre, applicant and owner. Item number four, application number 21-5.5, special exception modification for lighting upgrades at 1025 through 1091 West Main Street. Andrew ran, ran one applicant, Kiop Bramford LLC, Kimco Realty Owner. At said hearings, all persons will have the right to be heard. A copy of the application materials will be made available at least 24 hours ahead of the meeting at https colon backslash 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 www.dropbox.com backslash home backslash planning percentage 20 percentage 26 percentage 20 zoning under the folder for this particular meeting date. Written communication should be submitted via email to p-z at bramford ct.gov by noon of the day before the meeting for posting at the above Dropbox account associated with the town's website. Chuck Anders Chair, thank you, Marcy. We'll follow a normal format for public hearings. The applicant will go first, make its presentation. Uh, we'll have sh screen sharing capabilities. After the applicant makes its presentation, we turn it over to the commission. We typically hear a staff report uh, for, uh, from presented by a member of the staff and open up for questions, comments from commission members. At that point, we'll open up to the public. We ask that you state your name, uh, name and address for the record and uh, make your comments. Um, after the public portion, we allow the applicant to respond to the public portion. We may or may not uh, continue the public hearing. Uh, it's not unusual for complex applications to have more than one evening of public hearing. With that, I'll ask uh, Evan or Harry to review the procedures for participating in our Zoom remote hearing. Uh, sure, Evan Browning, Assistant Town Planner. 
Uh, if your computer has a microphone for two-way communication, then during a public hearing you wish to speak, uh, press the raise your hand in the participant window. Per the governor's executive order, if you speak, you will need to give your name. Uh, during public hearings, if you do not wish to speak, you can also type in your comments. And if you are dialing in by phone during the public hearing and you wish to speak, press star nine uh, to raise your hand. And again, if you speak, you must give your name before. Dr. Andrews here, thank you, Evan. Okay, we'll proceed with our public hearings. Our first item is the Mono East Development Group, LLC, John R. and Ann Hines, owners of 14 Buckley Road, Brantford Building Supplies, owners of 16 Buckley Road, and Brantford Building Supplies, owners of Zero Buckley Road. This is a special exception coastal site plan for an open space residential development. This is a continuation of a, a public hearing that uh, we opened, I believe, on May 20th. Is the applicant ready to proceed? Uh, Amy Suchins here representing Monoese Development Group. Uh, yes, we are, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Attorney Suchins. You may proceed. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, for the record, my name is Amy Suchins. I'm an attorney at Herwitz, Sager, and Sosberg Enough with offices in Milford. Uh, here representing Monoese Development Group. Um, also uh, with me tonight is Dave Sacco, who was here last time and is going to walk you through the um, details of our uh, revisions and response to comments. Uh, just by way of background, um, as uh, the chairman noted, we opened the hearing on uh, May 20th and gave our initial presentation uh, and heard some public comment uh, as well as commission questions. At that time, uh, DEEP was still conducting its review of the proposal under uh, the uh, Coastal Area Management Act and had some additional time and asked for uh, additional time. We were continued to June 3rd and that work was still underway as well as uh, our team was awaiting some additional staff comments um, from the um, uh, town fire marshal. And so that gets us to tonight. Uh, as outlined in your staff report, uh, we have submitted uh, revised plans earlier this week, uh, is including um, some proposed elevations of the buildings uh, that were requested in the initial staff report. Uh, we've also, um, and, and Dave will go through his, his memo, provided a memo um, accompanying the comments in response to the uh, fire marshal and more importantly the town engineer on some of the stormwater questions uh, that had been raised by uh, some of the neighbors and there was also a question raised in uh, Mr. Smith's staff report about the uh, open space and some questions about the implications of mean high water um, so what our plan is for this evening is I'm going to turn it over to Dave to walk you through uh, those uh, technical changes and the comments to the, um, the town review comments, and then turn it back. Uh, I'll come back up, discuss the issue with respect to uh, mean high water. We do understand that the um, staff has not had the opportunity to fully review all of the materials that we submitted um, earlier this week. I mean, frankly, everybody just got Deep's comment letter um, earlier today, so I'm not sure if even the, the commission members have had a chance to review that. Uh, so we we do understand and, and would consent to an extension of time. Um, I think the question is, there was also a, a question raised by Mr. Smith about um, whether we require an additional special exception for grading. Uh, we are actually working on those calculations and um, if it looks like we do need to submit an application um, I will speak with him about whether, um, by my calculations, we could still technically get a notice posted on the website and have that heard at the um, July 1st meeting. Um, so if we do continue, we can, we can make sure that that's um, made. I think all the issues, um, it's, it would be a technical submission, all of the items that are needed for that application, I believe, are already in the materials that uh, TPA provided. So with that, let me turn it over to uh, Dave Sacco, who will walk you through the uh, revisions to the plans. Good evening, my name is David Sacco. I'm a civil engineer with TPA Design Group in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, representing uh, Brantford Building Supplies this evening. 
I'm going to uh, step through the, the revisions that were made in response to, to staff comments. Um, the principal comments came from uh, the town engineer. Uh, he had asked, well, for uh, some background information to support the, the stormwater management report. We had made an assumption in the design regarding a percolation rate of assuming one inch per hour, uh, because at the time we were preparing the report, it was, it was winter and it was not practical to do testing. Uh, we did do the percolation test last week. We found uh, percolation rates in the range from an inch in five minutes to an inch in 10 minutes. We revised the calculations based on a conservative estimate of one inch in 20 minutes. Uh, as a result of this, we made one minor change to the plans. Uh, a section of pipe uh, at the north end of the development that was going to be used for infiltration will be used as a solid pipe since we don't need the additional infiltration capacity and also because that pipe uh, is the closest in proximity to the residences on Brightwood Lane. And in response to concerns expressed about uh, groundwater, we felt that it was appropriate to eliminate that area and retain the infiltration potential primarily farther south along the east side of the site uh, in more direct proximity to the wetland uh, to diminish the likelihood of any ground, of enhancing groundwater flow toward Brightwood Lane, make sure that the, as much as possible the infiltrated water was flowing toward the wetland uh, per the, the, the current general trend. Uh, other specific changes that have been made, um, the fire marshal had requested that we provide a fire hydrant. We provided a fire hydrant between unit four and three. It's roughly halfway between the extreme houses at either end of the development. Uh, the fire marshal also asked, did support the idea of an emergency connection. So we are retaining the connection to Brightwood Lane. However, we have added a gate uh, across that connection. It's now added to the plan. Uh, and finally, uh, the fire marshal expressed a preference for a roundabout as opposed to a hammerhead uh, in deference to Mr. Smith's concerns regarding uh, impervious area. We have also added a small island uh, that will be planted so that we're diminishing the, the the amount of impervious statement for that turnaround. Uh, we've also incorporated into the drawing set uh, a drawing that depicts the uh, fire truck turning pattern. If I can just go to that quickly. And as you can see, the fire truck is able to maneuver arc, off Arc Road, down the, the, the road, and navigate the turnaround without encroaching on the, the the planted island and back out again. The planted island would be built with a mountable curb and ground cover, uh, not uh, all shrubs or trees, so that in an, in an emergency, they could drive right over the top of it. Um, in response to other concerns, the, uh, the town engineer had requested uh, a profile view of the proposed utilities, the, the sanitary sewer extension as well as the storm. We have provided that. Uh, he commented that some of the details were not to Town of Branford standards and we have replaced those details with the applicable Town of Branford standard details. Um, and in response to a comment from DO, DEEP, um, they had asked about the possibility of uh, a footpath that would leave from roughly the area of the gazebo and extend to or where the existing WPCA maintained easement is. So we have depicted a potential location for that based roughly on the cleared path that was created for the DEP site visit last week. Uh, and that's been added to the plan. In addition, we've also enhanced the buffer plantings, both uh, here next to um, this residence, the Garganelli residence, and also along the west side of the site, along the four abutting properties along Brightwood Lane. 
Um, so just to reiterate, and then the other new addition to the plans is the inclusion of elevations for the four different building styles that are shown. Uh, the, the type A uh, is shown here, and we have the type B with a couple of other views, and the type C. Actually, my bad, three types, not four. Um, those are really the, the significant changes that have been made to the presentation, to the, to the submission materials uh, and that we really wanted to highlight this evening. Um, I just, the one thing I would like to reiterate in response to comments that were provided by the public, there's a, I understand there's a very understandable concern about stormwater management. Uh, I just want to review briefly the, the stormwater management overall concept. Again, this depicts the existing condition on the property in terms of watersheds. Uh, a watershed that drains down to the arc road system, a watershed that drains from roughly the, the west side of the site, west toward the residences on Brightwood Lane, and then the remainder of the disturbed area that drains east toward the wetland. And this is based on the existing topography, uh, including the, uh, the topsoil stockpile in the middle of the site. By comparison, what we're proposing to do is to significantly diminish the area that is running off toward the homes along Brightwood Lane. We're proposing to diminish the area that is running down toward Arc Road. Those areas are going to be diverted and provide runoff in the direction of the wetland. The current condition is really that much of this area drains to the wetland anyway. The, the rear yards, the, the houses abutting the, to the west drain to the rear. There's more or less a, a swale that flows along, water gets around the corner and eventually reaches the wetland. What we're doing is we're just trying to reroute it so that rather than flowing through the backyards, we're capturing it in a swale, we're capturing it in a structured drainage system in the roadway, and we're directing it toward the wetland without it impinging upon the neighboring homes uh, with the intent that we maintain uh, a good quantity and quality of flow to the wetland to support the wetland function. We diminish the impact on the neighbors to the west. Uh, we improve the quality of runoff by running it through a system that's designed to retain and slow the flow and provide opportunities for sedimentation uh, in, in catch basin sumps. Um, and in general, what we're seeking to do and what you know our stormwater modeling is showing is that we are diminishing the impact on the neighbors. We are not creating uh, a, a more difficult situation. We're discharging water to the wetlands in a non-erosive state because we are using a significant amount of retention. We are using groundwater truck recharge as much as feasible and practical throughout the project. Uh, one thing I would note is that with regard to the percolation tests, we are not, we have, we've assumed a very conservative uh, infiltration rate with respect to the ground surface. So even though we are providing uh, a, an infiltration swale along the west side of the site, we are not assuming that that is going to infiltrate rapidly. Uh, that we are assuming a, a percolation rate of a half an inch in an hour because it, water simply, although there is vegetative uptake and water will settle in the in the swale and slowly dissipate, uh, we don't anticipate it's going to be as efficient as uh, the, a pipe system, which is essentially buried in, in the existing sandy soils, which are, are uh, very good for, for infiltration uptake. And uh, that's, that's the highlight of what we have changed. We've tried to be responsive to the, to the commission's concerns, the staff's concerns. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to, to Amy to respond to other issues. Thank you. Uh, before I change topics, are there any 
did we want to have any questions from the commission on the technical changes or do you just want us to finish? Uh, Chuck Anderson, why don't you finish at this time and then we'll just handle it all. One time. Okay. Um, Dave, could you put up the grading plan that has the various jurisdictional lines? Thanks. Um, so what I wanted to address was uh, one of the comments in Harry's staff report was um, with respect to the uh, criteria in section 73B uh, about open space and the three options by which uh, the, this development is possible on a site of less than 15 acres. Um, and there are, there are three options, just as a reminder. One, if the open space is, is more than five acres, and, and we are in fact showing uh, more than five acres currently. Uh, two, if the open space is adjunct to existing permanently designated open space land outside the area covered by the application. Um, and in fact, here we're, we're directly adjacent as, as the deep letter notes um, and is shown on our plans, we're directly adjacent to the um, to land owned by the uh, Branford Land Trust. And there's also the um, uh, wetlands, tidal wetlands directly adjacent to us on the Great Oaks uh, condominium development uh, just to the left and I uh, can highlight um, that. And then third, the third option is open space would provide especially valuable open space resources. And I think it's important to note that those are um, uh, alternatives. We don't have to meet all three if we meet any of the one uh, any of the three, uh, we can set, we satisfy the criteria for um, the eligibility for this this nature of development. Um, so the question that Harry raised was um, whether the whether or how much of the open space is at an elevation uh, below mean high water, um, and highlights the fact that generally. Um, water or, or land below mean high water is in the public trust in Connecticut. Um, so what Dave is pulling up here is um, mean high water as a result of statutory changes. Um, we've shown the coastal jurisdiction line, which is generally how deep regulates um, now um, as a result of the change a couple of probably about uh, eight or nine years ago. And then mean high water um, was required to be calculated by a surveyor. Um, what, what Dave is highlighting for you is um, the line. It's, it's a very curvy, um, somewhat uh, amorphous line, particularly closest to the proposed development area and goes on, as you can see, onto the Great Oaks uh, property. Uh, the darker line that's more visible is the, with the triangles, is the uh, flagged tidal wetland uh, delineation, um, which seems to fall when you when you look at the overlap between the two lines, uh, falls somewhere between both mean high water and uh, the coastal jurisdiction line um, in in various various spots. So, the question with respect to uh, mean high water on this site, um, the line as you go um, further south on the property um, is actually interrupted by um, what everybody knows as the, the berm that's located there, um, we get down to the, the mean high water here is approximately elevation 2.7. The berm itself is, is closer to elevation, I believe it's five or six. Um, so, you know, factually, it's a little bit incongruous that the um, uh, mean high water uh, line comes back down, you know, it would, it would the, theoretically the tide would have to um, rise over the berm and then come back down. So we, we think, you know, the berm itself is acting as a little bit of a natural barrier um, from the lower elevation on the, on the waterwood side. Um, I would note that DEEP has never, you know, in, in multiple uh, trips out to the site and some communications, um, DEEP's never raised this concern about uh, open space or, you know, public trust with respect to, to mean high water. And I think that's because the concept behind your regulation um, really is about preservation of the open space uh, itself, not necessarily um, ownership. So even if we are to assume that um, there's an argument, and I would I would suggest that it's not the case, 
um, that we don't have any ownership interest or there is a public trust um, in the property below mean high water, I still think that your regulation and frank, frankly, your past practice of um, conditioning approvals on donation of uh, public open, excuse me, open space to the land trust or the town's own acquisition um, really highlight the fact that the open space is the governing consideration, not necessarily um, the elevation of the open space or whether or not it's above or below um, mean high water. And I think when you think about it, not only um, practically, but looking at the, the terms of your, your regulation, uh, the goal is to, in fact, um, you know, the, the purpose of the regulation is to preserve the open space, um, permits tracts of considerable size to be designed and developed for single family residential, uh, preserve land is unsubdivided, preserve land for the purposes of conserving natural resources, uh, preserve and protect particular areas and terrain having qualities of natural beauty or historic interest. Um, those are all items contained in uh, section 3A as the purpose um, of the open space residential development. And so here, when you look at the uh, process by which we got to this development plan, I think it's important to note that um, all of the land waterward of the tidal wetlands line. So basically even um, as you can see, the, the mean high water line is below the tidal wetlands line. For the purposes of this analysis, uh, both from, from a zoning perspective and this discussion about the, the effects of, of where mean high water is, um, all of that land has already been excluded from the calculation for the density factor um, under your regulation. So I think it's really important to note that this is not a question about mean high water where it affects what the development potential of this property is. All of that land has already been excluded and the 12 houses that you see are based solely on, um, although your regulation technically only requires the exclusion of steep slopes and inland wetlands, um, we were conservative and took, uh, took the approach um, after input from, uh, from your and I believe the inland wetland staff that the better approach would be to exclude those areas, even though not specifically uh, required to be. So I think when you look at what the effect of mean high water is on this particular property, uh, usually the concern would be is whether you're getting um, some sort of additional development potential or opportunity as a result of um, owning additional land that's being being donated or committed as open space. That's not the case here. This is this is um, uh, basically development on the on the six acres of upland with with that area excluded. Um, and then with respect to you know the question about whether there's actually ownership, um, I think again I just want to highlight the fact that uh, the purpose of your regulation is the preservation of the open space. If you were to only consider the land that is uh, above mean high water, I think then you wind up with a situation where you have conditioned other approvals um, on donation of land below mean high water or have um, required that. And frankly, I think it also undermines the um, inherent value that the town has placed on uh, open space, particularly in the circumstances where it does uh, result in the exchange of development potential. Um, one example that I'd like to highlight is, um, I think everybody's familiar right down the street, is um, the landing, which was uh, approved uh, quite a number of years ago. But if you think about that property, um, there is it's, it's similar to this in the sense that uh, there is a area of development in sort of a, what I would call sort of a central corridor. Um, it was approved with a condition requiring the donation of land to the Branford Land Trust and portion of the property um, convey or, or protected by conservation easement um, after that. And when you look at the elevation for uh, the property that was donated to the land trust, um, frankly, most of it, substantial amount of it um, is in fact below mean high water. And so if you sort of carry forward this 
thought process that somehow water or excuse me, land below mean high water should not be considered in the open space analysis. Um, frankly, it, the necessary conclusion is that then uh, someone like the Bland Branford Land Trust or frankly, even the town of Branford doesn't have any reason to own or protect uh, the open space. If the idea is that um, this shouldn't count because it doesn't have development potential or um, is likely to have minimal development potential, uh, frankly, there would be no need to have any kind of conservation easement or uh, you know, ownership by um, the town or something like the land trust or frankly, even um, conservation easement for, for this association or others to, uh, to protect that property because it would basically be uh, rendered undeveloped. And I don't think that was what the town had intended um, in approving and requiring these types of um, commitments of open space from, from prior developers or frankly from here. And uh, I don't think that's what you want as a goal um, it, to, to basically negate the long-term protection of what is considered to be uh, valuable and um, you know resources that are that should be and uh, should be protected to the to the greatest extent possible, whether by um, uh, conveyance to a, a nonprofit entity or protection by conservation easement. So I think at the end of the day, um, even if you were uh, to look at this, as I said, and um, you know, from strictly the perspective of what is available and would be protected below uh, mean high water, uh, I feel, still think that the proposal does meet all of the considerations that were outlined in um, 7.3b and the goals of, um, you know, and, and to touch on some of the issues raised in the, the neighbor's letter um, with respect to preservation of important resources. And I think that's that, that's highlighted by the fact that um, one of the things is that the, the deep letter does recognize that this um, open space does have uh, not only you know, current potential uh, for public access and opportunity, but it does provide connectivity for the long-term uh, by connecting uh, both this area to the uh, space adjacent with oh, currently owned by the land trust and the possibility of, of a later connection to the uh, town owned property. Um, so I think, I do think that regardless of uh, mean high water, the purpose and goals that are outlined um, for an open space subdivision or open space residential development, not subdivision, um, are satisfied here. And um, it's, there's, there's nothing that would prohibit you from finding this to be satisfactory uh, open space and um, you know, valuable under the purposes of that regulation. So with that, I think those are our um, substantive comments. I think I'd like to hear from the neighbors before, um, I don't know whether they'll be raising anything beyond their um, the written letter or if there are others we'll present. So we'll uh, wait to respond to those, but happy to answer any questions in the meantime. Andrew, Sarah, thank you, uh, Attorney Sugins. I'll, I'll ask a couple questions uh, on the on that issue that you just discussed on the ownership issue. I I, I saw this as a as a question of title, actually. The the if, if in fact, and I don't know this. I mean, I haven't really reviewed it. But if the claim is that you landowner only owns the fee to where the mean high water is, then you don't own, you know, you, you don't own what's represented uh, in this plan. You only own to where that squiggly line is. And, and therefore, you don't, you know, the, the, you, you don't own 15 acres. And so you don't, you can do it for less than 15 acres under the three criteria. But then I thought Harry's point was that therefore you don't, um, you know, you, you you don't come under one and two, you'd have to come under three. But, but what, one question, one factual question, what is the acreage using that where the, the, the squiggly mean high water line is? What is the actual acreage? What's it break out to be? 
Sure. So using, and I will tell you, given if, if, if you zoom in, um, you can see that the mean high water is actually um, just sort of, as I said, um, is, is a very inconsistent line, but generally follows the, what, what is the tidal wetland line. So if you use, as it's, it's actually shown on our zoning chart, um, we have excluding tidal wetlands. So everything from the tidal wetlands, well, what I think of as down, so south on the map. So we're actually covering a little bit more land because that's landward of mean high water. Uh, we still have 5.83 acres of development landward of the tidal wetlands line. Okay, so that's landward of the tidal wetlands, 5.3 acres landward of the right. tidal wetlands. So we, we uh, probably have a little bit more if you tracked exactly the, the very, um, and, and frankly, that, that would, we have land within the, the berm area, which is above mean high water. As you can see, there's a, a note called out, you get the sort of, um, the looks like a parallelogram, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> um, right there that Dave's, that Dave's showing. Um, so that I think you could, but I think you could use the, the area um, excluding tidal wetlands as a conservative number. I think we're probably a little bit closer to six, but that's, that's about where we are. Okay. So it sounds like you haven't done a precise calculation of what that would be, but you think it's around six. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Well, I, 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 and I understand your other argument. Your other argument is that you know you treated other applications in a certain ways, so you know you want to treat that. But that I, I was frankly looking at this. I don't know if we've had any other open space applications where the actual title. I, I, I mean, that, that's the issue. You, you, you own. <laughs> You, well, I guess I guess there are two property you want to give away if you don't own it. I mean, that's nice. <laughs> right. I guess so I guess there there are two questions. <laughs> was um, number one, there was a quiet title action that was that was brought regarding this property. The issue was never raised. The state of Connecticut participated. Um, I think for on um, some question, if we need information, I'm happy to get it for you for the next meeting. Um, but but there was no issue raised as to whether we do or do not own that remaining six acres. Um, and then more importantly, I also think that uh, DEEP has been out to this site three times. Um, they are the ones, you know, typically who would raise, you know, in reviewing the coastal, if there was a concern that, um, you know, th their letter asks us, you know, asks for you to approve this development subject to obtaining uh, a public access easement on the footpath, um, provision of a public, you know, walkway down to that. You know, none of that would be necessary if they thought that we didn't own the property because it was within the public trust. Yeah, I, and my take on that, um, uh, Attorney Suchins, is that Deep's in the, in the business of resource protection. Uh, they're, they're not uh, title. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if the AG, whoever it is, uh, for deep these days has an opinion on it. I, but I, you know, understand that average staff people are looking at, you know, the CAM policies and protecting resources or whatever, but I don't rely on, you know, someone for, for that. I, I mean, I, I get, you know, you look at a deed and the deed says that, but if, if in fact, and I don't know, I seem to look into this, I haven't really, and is it does, you know, for, for if your property abuts uh, title, Inflected area, then maybe your boundary changes, and 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 therefore, you know, if you only own a mean title, you don't, uh, you know, it's yours to give away. So any, anyway, that that's um, right. and I think that goes back to my point. I'm sorry, I can finish. Sure, go ahead, go ahead. Um, about you know how this has been reviewed or interpreted in in other circumstances. You know, if if your theory is correct then the land that the Branford Land Trust allegedly owns next to us, the Branford Land Trust doesn't own. Maybe they don't. I, I don't. I, I, and and so right. I, I guess I, I, there's a little bit of common sense to this too, that if, that if the idea is that anything below mean high water, 
never can never be owned and therefore never needs protection. Well, I think that has far broader implications about, you know, what you've protected in town, you know, has, has the town spent taxpayer money buying property it didn't technically need to preserve um, for open space because it might be below mean high water. I, I don't think that that's, um, you know, th that that could possibly be the case. And second of all, um, it's if, if there was a question of jurisdiction, um, you're the zoning commission. You're not the agency or, or the court tasked with deciding, um, you know, an issue of, of title. Well, well, what we have to do, I, I'm not even looking at the, you know, benefits of resource and protection and, and that. I, I'm looking at the regulation that says you have to have 15 acres or, or, or less than 15 acres. And then, you know, whether you, that's what I'm looking at. And, and that the, the assumption you came in is we own more than 15 acres because we own all that. And if in fact it's true that you only own a mean high water, then you don't. It's not, it's more of a technical question. It's not a question of is it good to preserve it or not? That's what I'm just looking at the regs. And I don't know where, if you had to give an opinion, where would you say your boundary is? I, I, you know, I, you, know, I, you, you can tell me that. I, I, I don't. We, we're probably going to ask our town attorney to look at it. So, so my, my, mm -hmm. I guess the, the second piece to my response would be, and in, in what I tried to highlight, even if we put aside the, the question of ownership and, and for the sake of this discussion, let's assume we only own to mean high water. Well, I, I do think that then there's still benefit and public space that's being provided because we are able to access and provide, um, uh, I, I think we still meet two and three then. Yeah, would you meet two? I understand three, I, uh, but, but, but two is, would you abut open space of other ones if the mean high water line is where, you're, where that is? I, I believe, well, then I guess the question becomes, if, if we're following mean high water, um, does, this goes back to the, to the land trust question, does the land trust technically own the property adjacent to it? Um, which is why I think you're, you're not tasked with looking at that. I, I do think we are because when you carry, carry that forward, um, I believe it's adjacent. I don't I, know. Yeah, I, 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 don't know. Who owns, I believe so. I mean, it, it, it may be part of it. Maybe. I don't know. I just don't know who owns right next to it. That's, that's yeah. the question. That's right. Yeah. So the, yeah. right. Yeah. Plan. There is a map. If, if Mr. Sacco could put, there's a map that shows the adjacent, uh, protected open space. And I believe it's the connection to the south of, so there you go. So that would show, so that immediately adjoining property to the east um, that might be contiguous to a portion of the property that is clearly above mean high water is not owned or protected open space. Okay. Okay. That, to the that's... southeast. Okay. So if we go by that map, then it looks like you, 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 you don't own contiguous land if, if that's correct. Above mean high water. Or, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, the, the contiguous open space is below mean high water because that's where the land trust is. I mean, you made reference to Great Oaks. I don't know where that is. Right to the left on the, yeah. basically part of it is in the tidal wetlands. If you look at this okay. map um, on the left side, there's the, the little star looking things. Right, so that's Great Oaks right there. Okay. I, uh, this is David Sacco. I would just add the comment that I, we've established that the sanitary sewer easement berm is above mean high water. It crosses the subject property okay. roughly here from north to south. It connects right. this property and it connects directly to the land trust property. Okay. And it's the particular strip of land that the DEP is particularly interested in because it is dry and it is a maintained access way and gives them some potential for connectivity. Is, 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 they, is that where the berm is? I mean, yes. The berm is roughly here. It's parallel to this okay. line and it, it, it runs across here. It continues down. Okay. Uh, so so you're, 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 
your argument would be that we come within two because a portion of our land that is above mean high water and that does abut land trust property. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay. And, and that's why you can't see it on, thank you for bringing to the other map because the, the one that I was looking at, I can see where it connects um, because when you look at the grading plan, you can't see the full connection of where the berm is. So this is, this is a better illustration. Okay. Um, Harry Switzer, can I ask a quick question? Um, I don't know, maybe this is for Mr. Sacco. Um, that berm, is that, uh, could you, are you able to state on the record that every portion is actually a continuous portion of land between the area of the property that's clearly above mean high water and the adjoining protected open space that is at all points above mean high water? You know, a continuous strip that's above mean high water that's in that area. This is roughly where the easement is. And yep. the e easement area, the embankment is maintained and is above mean high water. Okay. I, I can't, yes, that, that much is, is true based on, on the, the survey and based on uh, the information that we've got. And that's uh, talking about 10 feet of width or something like that. Approximately well, something like that. It's wider. It's it, the top of the embankment is is eight to ten feet wide. Okay. It's maintained as an access way by WPCA because they have manholes along here. Uh, Marcy Pluzzi, how does that elevation compare to the flood zone elevations or like hundred year flood? Is it above oh, that? The, no, no. The top, the, the the base flood elevation in the area is elevation twelve. Okay. So this, the entire embankment is subject to inundation during a hundred year event. So four feet or so, it looks like you're, go, you're grading up about four feet along that edge. We, well, we're not proposing to do anything here. We but are the side, proposing the... to raise our grade by yes, roughly uh, four, four feet or so at the, at, the, at the highest point, roughly along this side, four to five feet. And what was the slope? Two to one, three to one? Three to one. So really, you you held to the hundred year buffer, and then made it flood compliant. So that I guess as we as we discuss this mean high tide line and access, you know, I look at it more as not really open space for any kind of hiking necessarily, but more contiguous open space for uh, as a wildlife corridor or you know protection of wetlands and you know it, you know that buffer does that. But I'm I just find myself thinking about the steepness of the slope to get up to the flood elevation relative to, you know, the real world condition, you know, you're creating sort of a new flood edge because of the way it's, it's graded. I mean, I, I, is that a fair assessment? I, I guess there's not really a question. It's more of an observation. Well, you know, we're, we're intentionally trying to, the, the edge is severe because what we're trying to do is we're also trying to heed the request that was made by DEEP previously to, to provide a 100% 100, 100 foot buffer from the tidal wetland line. So we've done that. And in order to maintain uh, development potential, we do have to have a steeper bank. Mm. Now, in terms of flooding, I, I, as I stated before, this is a coastal flood zone. This is not a river type of flood zone. So the fact that a portion of the site is elevated does not affect the flood behavior relative to other areas because the water gets to this. The flood occurs because water is coming in from the shoreline due to storm surge, ex you know, extreme tide events, hurricane kind of things. This is not a situation where water is coming downstream and uh, gathering, you know, volume and momentum as it progresses and where uh, creating a high spot necessarily displaces storage and capacity elsewhere. This is a situation where this has no meaningful impact on how high the flood gets elsewhere because the flood is defined by the elevation in a large open body of water, the Long Island Sound. Mm -hmm. you know, that's what we, you know, we're pushing back against that. 
you know, I understand. I'm just sort of thinking about the environment that, you know, we make these, you know, wetlands makes these guidelines that you have to have a hundred foot of upland review. And, you know, when we make these sort of arbitrary lines in, in space and, you know, sometimes I guess I, you know, to me, it should make sense to what's there originally in terms of the shape of the contour, as opposed to the shape of the, the wetland, you know, cause the wetlands what defined by the soils and the plantings, not necessarily the water's edge. You know, you can see the difference between the, the jurisdictional mean high tide line doesn't run parallel to the, the wetland line, you know, so you've got two, different lines in the environment and then and yet again you get a different edge for the tree line i assume that that tree line is the existing tree line so like i'm just looking at the bottom of the page where you have the the wetland line with close to the edge of the tree line and an open area and then this steep slope up and you know i feel like the planting is is following the the steep slope but i just i just am trying to digest the the best way to handle that ecosystem, you know, from a micro, micro sort of viewpoint and also a macro viewpoint as far as making a contiguous natural looking corridor. And it, you know, the, the carving of the land feels abrupt there to accomplish what you're proposing. You know, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to put say good or bad, but it just seems very, you know, it's a very strong, cut into the ground plane to create what you're creating over a long length. <laughs> um, thanks, Marcy. Um, I, I have a follow-up question, Mr. Sacco, uh, just about the stormwater. You, you made the, well, about the, you, you made the distinction between a stormwater, but when you bring in fill in, in, in a low elevation area, if it were simply stormwater from storms or whatever, that that fill could displace what could be used as a storage area for that stormwater. Uh, and, and that would be one thing and therefore cause the water to maybe go other places like the neighboring properties, which it wouldn't had you not brought in the fill. That's sort of one scenario. And you're saying that's not this because we're looking at a coastal surge and that is the, that, that, that is a, a more broader type of thing. It happens all over the place. And when we bring in fill to, to uh, in, in our situation, and that's the type of surge, it, it doesn't have the impacts because it's, it's more encompassing. And it, it's, even though we, I suppose it, it could, you know, you are displacing stuff, but it, but it's, it's so everywhere that it doesn't make a difference. Am I understanding that correctly? Or what a, is that right or, or what? Yes, that's, that's basically what I'm saying is that, you know, the, the volume of flood water is defined by an offshore event that's pushing water inland. And we're elevating to provide a safe platform for residential development. But, the, you know, what we're talking about in terms of impact on, on the surface elevation of flood water is is minimal because the volume of water that you're talking about is literally it, it, it's it's the it's Long Island Sound and it's the entire volume of all of the of the Branford River and the and the tidal wetlands three thousand feet down from from this site to the Branford River. There's a the the water that's coming in is not the volume of water that's coming in is is so substantial relative to the volume of fill placed in this one location that the that the surrounding areas to this site are not going to see a difference in terms of how the flood behaves oh, okay I, and i okay there, there, i have sort of two questions sort of some of that 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 sort of distinction number one that assumes that the problems that you have now for flooding are due solely to, to the the uh, Long Island Sound events rather than just stormwater events. And I don't, and I guess my question is, is that the correct? In other words, do we experience flooding in the events, not, you know, not because of high tides or whatever, but 
just because of 100-year storms or big storms, because I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I know there's all sorts of pictures, and I know that there's tidal issues, and, and that place was hit bad and Tabor, and you can go now, and even the roads are sometimes, you know, have water on them. But that said, I don't know if independent of the, of the of, of saltwater storm events that the freshwater you know, storm events cause flooding problems. I just don't know that. And I, I, I don't know what, what's your answer to that. Uh, there's a couple of levels to this. There's the hundred year rainfall event and the hundred year flood event are not the same thing necessarily. And the hundred, you can have one completely without the other. You can have a, a very high standing water level due to a storm surge and minimal rainfall. Conversely, you can have extremely high rainfall that in this area, if it's occurring on low tide, is going to have virtually no impact in a lot of areas. It's going to have localized impacts in some areas because of the capacity of stormwater systems and because of the elevations. The stormwater design for this site was evaluated the 100-year storm. We evaluated the 100-year rainfall on this site. And we designed a system that is intended to accommodate that rainfall and to generate less runoff in that 100-year rainfall event because we are providing for stormwater retention. We're providing for stormwater infiltration to groundwater. We are modifying the existing runoff pattern so that we're taking water that today runs off that site toward the Western neighbors and we're redirecting it directly to the wetland. That's speaking to the rainfall event. And can you have uh, a rainfall event that results in flooding on Ark Road? Certainly. Could you have a rainfall event that results in, but those are, those are based on local circumstances. And uh, even here, they're based on tidal influences. When we have a very high spring tide combined with heavy rainstorm, we lose the capacity to discharge storm water and it backs up in places. Now, what we're trying to do is diminish runoff to the arc road system so that the rainfall event is not worse because of the development. And we're diminishing runoff to the neighbors and to the wetlands so that the rainfall event does not have a detrimental effect on the neighborhood. The offshore event, the hurricane, the massive storm surge, that's something that's obviously we can't design a, a storm water system to manage that. And sometimes that event does not even reflect a heavy rainfall. It reflects a tidal surge and other effects. Okay. Okay. So to so that question, I said, well, you're, you're adding fill that could displace it, but your answer is, yeah, in theory, but we designed a system because we're retaining more water and we're infiltrating it and we're re redirecting it in a way that it isn't going to impact the abutters. That seems to be what you're saying for the, for that, uh, for the rain of that. I, I'm still a little um, on this, on the storm, on the saltwater infiltration business, I'm, I'm still questioning the, 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 the idea that because it is happens along everywhere, that even if we, and it's coming from the other direction, because that's, you know, it's coming from the saltwater, it's not coming, and one, one of your stormwater techniques is re redirect it to the saltwater. For the freshwater, you're re redirecting it. Well, that ain't gonna work. <laughs> because that's where it's coming from. So when you have the salt water that would normally sit in that area, it's not gonna be able to sit there. It's gonna have to go around. And it seems to me intuitively that that could still happen. It could, you could have an impact from the salt water storm surge that um, you know, because you're adding that fill, and it seems to be your argument is well, because it's so massive, the amount of fill we're at, it's not going to make that much of a difference because it is so encompassing. I mean, is that right? Because, you know, I don't know. 
I'm, you know, I, I, I would have to look at numbers, but frankly, we're talking, I, the site, the, the whole area in the event of a 100 year event is going to be underwater. And the volume of that water, several feet deep over thousands of acres, um, whether, you know, the fact that this volume of material has been placed, looking at the area that is inundated, it is not going to make a significant difference in terms of the final water elevation of that flood event. Yeah, and, and, and I guess what I'm, I'm not, not every event is going to flood everything, but there, it could be more no. incremental. That's what I'm thinking. What, what if you have some that because of this, there may be a marginal, it's called marginal, but it may have an immediate impact. It's not going to, whatever, it, it, the storm comes up to some place. And because this is there and it wasn't there before, that there is going to be um, some greater uh, info, uh, uh, exposure of the neighboring properties that would not have been granted. And, and there'd be disasters where they're always going to be covered, but there could be events where you know, an intermediate event where it could have an impact. That's what I'm struggling with. And, and, and I, don't, I don't know what you can say to that. I, this, the same phenomenon uh, uh, prevails because in order for water to even get this far up into the, into, into the area, you will have already accumulated a tremendous amount of flood volume downhill, downstream. It's going to have to have already gotten many feet deep in other areas south of the site uh, and, and in order to, to get to the point where it begins to affect this area. And it, the same calculation applies. You're talking about a very small area that's been raised relative to a very large volume of water that's coming in and mathematically you're, the net effect is, is, is minimal. Okay, that, that's uh, Chuck Anders here, thanks. Um, I, Harry, we didn't, um, did you wanna go over things in your staff report? We'll get to the public in a bit here. I'm sorry, we just gotta get through the commission can, members. Can I ask one more question though? Sure, absolutely. I wanted to yeah, oh, vary in commission, but go ahead, Marcy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I, I realized what I was trying to say about, you know, cutting into the landscape. You've got the whole, so I guess I'm gonna call it the Southern Life, this meandering slope that's, you know, in places almost eight feet at a three to one slope. And it's just a consistent grade. And, you know, when you look at the bottom of the sheet where you've got three trees indicated, you know, you've still got a good amount of space between there and units eight and nine. Like, why can't we soften the, the that slope there or at the end of the cul-de-sac, put a wall so that you can change the feeling of that slope there or you know along at the end by six and seven change you know we've got a little bit of space on site so it's just not such a hard engineered kind of slope and and i'm having a hard time following when you get up to building seven where that existing tree line goes and what the impact's going to be from adding that much fill into the the drip line of those trees you know are you going to be in a sense really having to remove trees in that upland review area you know, so th that's where my concern was as far as, you know, I see the engineering solution. I understand the tidal impact with the volume of water, but I'm, I'm in my mind, equating it to the livability with um, how it's impacting the trees and the environment immediately right there. Um. It's something we can take a look at. Um, I'm I'm not sure how to respond. We're trying to balance, uh, you know, a request from DEP to be as protective of po as possible of the tidal wetland with the the you know the owner's interest in 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 successfully developing the property, and you know we're trying to come up with. A retaining wall is a solution. It's a harsher solution than a slope is. Um, we can 
you know, it's something we can talk to them about. I'm just saying that there might be places where a retaining wall might be more appropriate or pushing the slope grade back, like at ex, uh, units eight, nine, and 10, you know, and softening the slope, you know, because right now you just go from flat yard to two to one or three to one slope to, you know, upland review area. I'm not saying to necessarily go into that buffer, but I think pushing back into the development in a, maybe some softer or more sinuous way to have it feel a little bit more natural to, uh, you know, as instead of just sort of drawing a line, an arbitrary line in the sand, because that's where the upland review area ends. It doesn't relate to anything in the field. You know, it doesn't even really relate to the design that you're proposing only, except only to maximize the, the developable area possible for what you're doing. You know, I realize you've got to make the project work financially, but I mean, that's, it just seems very extreme to me. And I'd like, I'd like to see some, you know, some softer options on that edge. I guess that's the request. Understood. Chuck? Chuck? Yeah, Fred, yeah, Fred. Go, uh, Fred, go ahead. Yeah, uh, my question is this to uh, Dave Sacco. Um, it was mentioned, I think, on the, the previous uh, public hearing we had that some of the maybe all of them, depends on who the potential buyer is, uh, would have a basement. And so I'm concerned about the amount of soil that's removed in what, where we don't see it, uh, you know, for, which would make less, uh, it would create a, a longer time for water to drain, I would, I would think, as opposed to being on slabs. So I, I'm just, if Dave can address about removing soil, you know, to, to provide basements. Does that sort of hurt the whole uh, drainage uh, idea? We've we've discussed this with the developer, and the houses will be slab on grade. We're not proposing to do basements for any of the houses. Okay, I mean, when we I think when you first said it, I think the owner mentioned that there'd be slabs, slab on grade, and and uh, semi basements and basements. Right. That we believe it's more practical to not have basements for the homes because of. The, the prevailing conditions that, you know, they're that given that they'll, you know, they're sitting above the base flood elevation, but the basements would be well below the base flood elevation. Um, and, you know, given that we're, you know, trying aggressively to infiltrate ground, uh, run off from the roofs and everything. Well, that was that my thought. The, yeah. the, the, the better approach is to simply not have basements. Okay. All right. Chuck Hans here. Thanks, Fred. Um, Harry, did you want to go over anything else in the staff report? And we can maybe further questions from commission members. But Harry, did you want to run over that? Sure. Harry Smith, Town Planner. Um, I'll touch on a couple things. I think most of the comments in the uh, most recent uh, update memo I sent to the commission and to the applicant have been addressed and covered. Um, but I do want to start with, uh, I think, um, echoing Marcy's comment. I think she brings up some really excellent points that were brought up um, by myself in some real preliminary comments is that the design of the development is not really as sensitive to the property as it could be in many respects, including that hard edge of the fill, um, sort of the flatness and plateau nature of the fill area where the development's going to be. And, uh, you know, there's a couple of the natural features that are basically going to be eradicated or reduced. Uh, so the whole thing in a combination, um, you know, it's really, you know, the site's kind of being terraformed in a way. And, you know, to comply with the letter of the DEP recommendation uh, that you're 100 feet back from the tidal wetland, um, you're being possibly less sensitive to the site in terms of proposing a development than you could be. Um, it's sort of almost you know, running against the intent of the, the hundred foot buffer, you know, is to provide some protection for natural feature, but there are a collection of natural features in the property. And there's, you know, livability aspect to having that hard slope and, and all things that Marcy said, I think are excellent points. Um, I do have a question about the map that shows where the mean high water line is that I did not see that sheet in the set. Is that sheet two or a revised version of sheet two? With the grading on it, 
Yes, that the it's a revised version of of sheet two, the grading and drainage plan that was included with what was submitted uh, the other day. Okay, so it's the second set, the or the third set, if you will. It's not Correct. in the hard copy we just got because I just opened that up so I could see it because okay. it's hard for me to see the large scale plans on my tiny little screen. So that's why it kind of. I what... believe it should have been in the hard copy set. I uh, did not, not if it's sheet two, I did not see it. So um, that might, okay. I'll, I have the wrong set in here. I'll, I will check and, and make okay. sure that we get hard copies for you. All right. I just want to reiterate a point that was brought up um, at the beginning of the public hearing by the consulting planner and their staff report, which was who is to get the proposed open space. That's something that um, I believe the regulations ask be clarified and proposed as part of the review of the development. And even though I think it's been mentioned that there are negotiations or possibly negotiations with the land trust, uh, there's been nothing that I know of representing that they're willing to take the open space land um, at this point. Is that, am I correct in my understanding? Right, uh, Amy Suchins for the record. Um, at this point, the uh, expectation is that we do think that with the design, it's going to remain um, as a part of the community, as an amenity to the community, and then we'll track, um, frankly, similar to what is outlined in the deep letter, that it would be protected by conservation easement and confirmed as that in the um, common interest ownership documents. So you're talking about a homeowners association owning the property? Correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, we should have that in writing at some point, even though you've just stated it verbally. Um, and uh, just a question um, uh, on the maintenance of the stormwater system. I mean, a lot of these stormwater designs, the proof is really in how well they're maintained in terms of how well they function over time. I hope you would not disagree with that. Um, right. And um, I assume there are manufacturers recommendations and you would have um, best practices in terms of, uh, recommendations regarding cleaning out the uh, the ditch area and it's it understands sort of a sequence of uh, almost many sedimentation basins um, and how that would be maintained over time to maintain its functionality and so forth. So I don't know if that information has been included. So frankly, I've not been through the stormwater um, detailed information. Um, but if you could say a few things about that on the record, that would be great. Um, Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so we honestly, I don't know if it's in the report or not. We will definitely provide a stormwater management maintenance plan that would involve periodic inspection of all of the systems, whether it's the infiltrators or the stormwater structures in the street or the uh, infiltration swells and, and provide recommendations for how to maintain them, how often to maintain them, how to review them so that they can be properly kept and uh, uh, function properly for a long time. Okay. Um, not to take up too much time, I just want to uh, touch back on some of the items in the staff report or the staff update report that I submitted. One is that we are waiting for a response from the town engineer with respect to the applicant's response to his initial comments. Um, so that's outstanding. Uh, we did get a response back from the fire department that afforded the commission that was alluded to in the applicant's presentation. And I believe the applicants already adjusted their plans in response to those comments. Um, so we will send the revised plans to the fire department for them to take a look at. Um, and uh, the DEP letter, you know, I, I won't say much about it, except that it seems to focus on um, providing a trail, as was mentioned, along that berm um, to possibly connect with other um, trail networks in the future, though it's not clear how that would cross what I understand is sort of a water course of some kind, a Sybil Creek or some portion of it on the southeast area of the property, which would be, you know, the berm. I don't know if that goes right through that. I don't know how that works down there, to tell you the truth. Um, And I think it's been discussed whether or not another approval might be needed under section 6.8, which is the grading uh, section in the regulations. But I just want to leave with um, the wording of the 
um, zoning regulations with respect to the open space and the three uh, possibilities that were mentioned by Attorney Suchin's. And it may really boil down, and number two, to the wording um, adjunct. Um, so is, you know, the commission may want to consider the eight to 10 foot width of the berm, assuming it's all above mean high water. Um, is that sufficient to address the term adjunct? And if it, you don't, does this bring you to the third possibility and what conclusion the commission may want to draw about um, the open space being especially valuable. Um, and I'll just say, I don't really, maybe I need a little clarity from attorney Suchin's. I did not hear you say, or, or absolutely refute the question or the position that the land below mean high water is not owned by your client. Um, and I did not assert that, but I raised the question and, and I did not hear any active absolute opinion that yes, it's owned by my client. End of story. Um, it, it seemed to possibly concede that it may not be owned by your client. Um, so, um, I'll just leave that there. And, um, if anybody has any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Uh, Chuck Anderson, thank you, Harry. Are there any further questions from commission members before we open up to the public? Hearing none, uh, let's open it up for public comments. And uh, Evan, uh, who's first? Um, Evan Brining, Assistant Town Planner. Uh, I'd just like to ask everyone who would like to participate, please uh, use the raise your hand function next to your name on the participant list. Um, I believe we have a few already, but first up, um, Louisa Delan, please. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to thank everybody for their um, patience and their attention to this. Uh, we did submit a letter, which I think has been received by the town planner and planning and zoning um, from the Protect Our Wetlands group, which has come out of this um, project. So in the last you know, three weeks, I've had the opportunity to meet with many of our neighbors on both Ark Road and Marshall Place, which is the area to the south, which a lot of that wetlands area drains into, um, and then also Marshall Road and Tabor Drive. So at this point, we have a pretty strong group of people who are really concerned about this development. Um, and I'd just like to show you a few things when you're talking about the flooding and you're talking about it, um, it can sound very theoretical, um, but truthfully for us, it's not just when there's a high tide. It's also when there is rain or when there's any storm event that the whole area at this time floods. So many times throughout the year, we are not able to leave through different areas. Um, we do, we did submit photographs to that effect. And I understand what you're saying about creating a central area um, that is above and that has a whole drainage, you know, capacity to it. Um, but I would just say that that drainage would then go to the south where there's already impact of water. And then also on that area of the map, that's also where the Zucalic project um, area is and Ecology Park, which are both, you know, lands that were dumps. So all that, you know, there's water seeping into the sound from that. And there are houses along the way. So I would just say that um, to look into, you know, has the land that we're talking about right now been tested at any time? There's a chance that it was used for dumping at some point. Um, those are things just to be considered. But I thought if you wouldn't mind, I'm not going to take up a lot of time today, but I'd just like to show you a brief gallery of some of the images which are on our website which anyone can take any time to look at if that's okay um, if you wouldn't mind opening up sharing for me that would be really helpful i will make you a co-host this is harry smith town planner um all right, you should be able to share your screen now thank you very much Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so this is, um, as I'm sure everyone's familiar with, this is Tabor Drive. Um, and this is when we had just one day of rain and it was five days away from a high 
you know, a full moon. So just to say like, it is influenced by the tide, but we also have Sybil Creek in the area and the Branford River. And it essentially results in a trifecta of um, flooding. So you can see this is going right across the road here and that's down at Tabor Drive. You can see the, you know, scale here. And then when we get a little bit closer, these are my neighbors on Arc Road, where at the Kitty Corner to Buckley Road, to that intersection. Um, this is the house right on Arc Road, and then this one here. And you can just see the flooding is completely around that. Um, when you're talking about the project draining now into Arc Road, this is exactly where it would be draining. And as we look through here, this is the end of Buckley Road, and you can just see people couldn't get out of here for days. This was not a 100 year event. This was a storm. Um, this is a great image that just shows the fire hydrant just emerging from there. Um, I understand that an unnatural island would be created for these 12 homes, um, but that will displace things. And there is the issue of when the land was cleared before for agriculture. I do not know that there was a tree marshal out there to check anything, but indeed many natural features were compromised at that time. And a lot of old growth trees and large trees were taken away, which has resulted in more flooding for my neighbors who are on this call. Neil and many others have experienced more, Neil and Holly and, and those people on that side. So, you know, at your leisure, take your time. You're more than welcome on your own time to go to this website. These are images I compiled and our neighbors sent to me. So I just wanted to be sure that those were, were seen by all too. Um, and there are many other concerns that we all have, but I'm going to allow other people to speak to those as well. Thank you so much for your time today. And, and then the last thing I would say is that there's, you know, many people could not attend this today because of it being on Zoom. We have a number of elderly people in our area. And also with that link being sent out, I'm hoping that many people were able to join, but I'm not sure. So I would like to ask for an extension for this to be, for the public hearing component to just be extended to the next in-person meeting. Uh, Iris, what's up? Here's the town planner. Just uh, Louisa, if um, it looked like several of those photos are already um, part of the package that you submitted, um, both hard copies, and I believe we um, sent that and scanned it, sent it to um, all the Planning and Zoning Commission members. But if there's some images there um, that weren't in that packet, if you could forward those to us um, so we can get those up I, on a Dropbox. I will. Yeah, yeah thank you. Be able to see them. Thank you so much, um, Harry. I appreciate that. Yeah, I did show it today because um, a neighbor just was able to get all of her ones from um, a FEMA thing. She just got them all today. So there are new ones on there, the Arc Road ones, which are, you know, directly impacted by this. That's why I did show it. And um, thank you very much. I certainly will get those to you. All right. Thank you. Uh, and Chuck and share just on the question of extending the public hearing, the applicant did indicate at the beginning that she, uh, that the applicant is consenting to an extension so the expectation is we, this would be continued to an in-person meeting on July 1st at the firehouse. So, um, so uh, Evan, who's next? Uh, Evan Browning, assistant town planner. Uh, next is Bill Horn. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, Bill Horn, 246 Pleasant Point Road. Um, I wanted to speak to the question of the state's attitude towards the ownership of land below the mean high water line. I have a little bit of experience with this from when the town um, was acquiring a parcel of land at the end of Helen Road that has um, about five acres of tidal wetlands that are below the mean high water line. Um, and um, the town applied for a state open space grant, which it received. And in the process of um, going through all the paperwork to sort of get from the award to the, from, from the announcement of the award to actually receiving the money, um, we had to revise the, um, the survey, the record map, uh, to show that only the land above the mean high water line was included um, it, it, in the warranty deed. Uh, so it was 16.7 acres. Um, now, because the town land records uh, include information about ownership interests that farmers developed in the tidal wetlands prior to the definition of the, the current definition of the public trust, 
the attorneys on both sides felt that it was important to also have a quick claim deed, which quick claimed the area below Mean High Water to the land trust. And there's a separate uh, record map showing that. So this is all shown in record maps 3704 and 3705. Um, but it was pretty clear that Deep felt very strongly that it owned the land below the mean high water line. Thank you. And thank, you, thank you, Mr. Horn. Evan, who's next? Uh, Claudio and Barbara. Hi, it's Claudio Ricitelli. Um I'd like to start by just saying, you know, I hear words like minimal effect, roughly so many acres, anticipate, uh, anticipate low impact upon abutting neighborhoods. Um, how can you present a development with so many inconsistencies to begin with? It, it, it really it makes me wonder why there's so many variables in this project. And I'm saying to myself, well, so if you're going to present this, shouldn't you have like accurate numbers? So where is that line? Is that squiggle line really where it should be? Or is it 10 feet out or 10 feet in? None of it makes sense to me. And my other question is, does DEP really feel like this is a stretch or is it is it actually a, 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 a viable project? Um, and, and, and that's probably one of my basic questions is, TP looks at this and they're like, well, you're, you're raising grade and you're dumping water into um, tidal wetlands by raising grade. I, I think Marcy mentioned this where it was like an eight foot slope going back into wetlands. Where, where does everyone think the water's going? It's going back into it. So how are we affecting tidal wetlands? How are we affecting abutting neighbors? These are my questions where we have a neighborhood established. Now, all of a sudden, we're going to affect it with, with this 12 home development. And now, all of a sudden, it's going to change water distribution either into the cul-de-sac, into the wetlands, into the tidal wetlands, or is it wetlands? I really don't know anymore. And um, and my, my last question is that um, the fire department had mentioned that, yes, that we could have access from the cul-de-sac how do you how do you gain access from that you're raising a grade another whatever it is at the cul-de-sac to like or the, well from from the the right, development right. to the cul-de-sac right like cul -de -sac. right exactly how do you access it at that point in time with what like an eight foot grade I just don't From get Brightwood to Buckley. Right, Brightwood to Buckley. You're gonna raise it almost eight feet. So how do you access that for fire truck? Exactly. So for emergency access. So those those are my questions, and and, and I really don't understand how all these can be possible. And again, as I said before, you're just trying to cram too much into this one little project. Um, I appreciate all your time and help. Um, you know what? And, and again, and you know what? Everyone has a right to build on their property, but within a certain limit. And I, I just think it's too much. I really do. I, I think he's really fighting what he's trying to do. But thank you so much for what you guys do. Appreciate it. Chuck Anderson. And, and sir, did you say your name for the record? You probably did. And I missed it. Uh, Claudia Richitelli, 23 oh. Brightwood Lane. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Uh, Evan, who's next? Um, Mr. Terrell, Evan Brighting Assistant Town Hi, my name is uh, Dick Terrell. I live on uh, Brightwood Lane. Um, I have a few questions for, I guess, Mr. Sacco. Um, I'm very concerned about water coming from their development onto our property. 
as I stated at the last meeting, um, uh, part of the property, Giordano's Buckley Road project, it's already higher than ours. And, and I'm already getting water on my property from uh, trees and vegetation that was cleared because of the tornado that we had last summer. And my understanding is that they're gonna raise the elevation four to six feet for the entire project. And the only thing I've heard Mr. Um, Sacco say is the only thing that's gonna protect our properties on the west side is a swale. And you know, you get two inches of rain in a few hours. What happens when the swale fills and it doesn't, you know, move quick enough? Um, you know, I remember him saying that they're gonna have uh, things in place to try to slow it down so it doesn't get to the wetlands too fast. So, so my question is, you know, um, now how deep and how wide is this swale going to be? Is it going to be something that's, you know, six inches and it's going to handle, you know, uh, rain pouring down a slope of six to eight feet? Um, if, if somebody can answer those questions, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Chuck Anders, Chair. I, attorney, uh, attorney Sitchins, I assume you're taking notes here. There's been a couple of questions about the raise of eight foot for the uh, cul-de-sac and, and then another drainage question that I did. Yeah, maybe I, I'm taking notes and I think we'd probably be easiest given some of the overlap on some of the questions to just ant let everybody speak and then respond to uh, respond to them. We can respond to them all at the end because there's also uh, similar comments in the letter that was provided. Sure. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, Evan Brining, this is the town planner. Thank you, Mr. Terrell. Uh, next up is um, somebody with the letters MME listed as their name. I was wondering if you could uh, please state your name at the beginning of your statement or question. Sure. Maria Earhart, 5 Marshall Place. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I have a couple of concerns and questions, um, one of which is being that I have heard some discussion um, of buffers, plantings, redirection of drainings. Um, I'd say most, if not all of which was has been discussed in terms of Brightwood. So we are directly abutting the property and we have heard nothing about buffers redirecting here, how is that going to impact us on this side on Marshall Place? So I think that's something that we would like to see addressed um, moving forward as the discussions progress. The other questions we have um, or concerns is that it's our understanding that the applicant cleared the land under the premise that they were going to develop a vineyard. And apparently uh, when you're clearing your land for agriculture, use doesn't require any permits so the land was clear cut um i think somebody alluded to um tr a tree issue so there's no knowledge of preserving any significant trees that were there the property was clear cut and then what seems to be bait and switch now there's going to be a development there so could anybody just do that? And there is no consequence or no ramifications. Has the soil been tested there? Where did all the material go? What's happening on that property there? Heard many disturbing stories of people who have lived in the area for 50 and 60 years, um, who have uh, seen and been, um, been among barrels of who knows what um, in, in terms of pollutants that might be back there. Um, so that is a major, major concern. And we would like to know um, if it's not this commission that would address that, who would address that? Um, and again, as a taxpayer, I have a real issue with um, somebody clear cutting a large swath of land in the middle of um, several neighborhoods under the guise of, I'm gonna plant some grape trees or vines um, and then Lo and behold, now we're going to hear we're going to come forward with um, putting putting this development in there. So I would like to have some clarification on that. I think that's a very significant issue. The only other thing I would like to add here is that um, this is an interior lot, not visible by any main road, um, you know, accessible through a current gravel, very narrow private road. 
Um, and the proposed development map shows, in fact, that not only is that an interior lot, but I believe, um, if I saw correctly, homes uh, 11 and 12, I don't know which is which, but I think 12 is actually in the backyard of 11. Um, and then back down in the cul-de-sac, um, what is it? Property parcel number six is in the backyard through a driveway of five and seven. That is absolutely not consistent with anything that is in this neighborhood. Anything in this neighborhood is clearly street front. There is nothing. You go down someone's driveway and there's a house back there. So I would like the commission to consider that this is not in the spirit of the existing neighborhood that is in here in addition to all the other technical concerns about, about the, the um, drainage and um, all the eco-sensitive issues that are happening with the property. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. Who's, uh, who's next, Evan? Uh, I believe it's back to the Riccatellis. Could you unmute yourself, please? Yes, thank you. I just did. I'm Barbara Lucas Ricciatelli. Um, I just was looking to tag what Maria just said. If this was not an o submitted as an open space development, it would be, I assume, defined as an interior lot because it does not have frontage on a public road. So I was looking at those definitions and if somebody could answer for me, I could not find a de definition of what a fee strip is. I'm thinking that's a driveway or access road to an interior lot. Couldn't find a definition if somebody could define that. And in the requirements for building on an interior lot, it says that the fee strip needs to be 25 feet in width. I think on the plans, it was either 20 or 24 feet for the proposed Buckley reconstruction. So I'm wondering if that 25 feet in width minimum is the same to service an open space plan. Since this is really an interior lot, there's no public frontage on any of these parcels that are part of the part of the application. That's my question. Thank you so much for all your attention. Appreciate it. Chuck Andrews Chair, thank you, Ms. Richard Telling. Um, we're making uh, notes. Uh, Evan, who else? Um, anyone else commenting at this time? Uh, Evan Brining, Assistant Town Planner. I do not see anyone else at this time, but I would like to ask one more time, anybody that would like to comment, please use the raise your hand function next to your name on the participant list. I do not see anyone at this time. Uh, Chuck Anderson, thank you, Evan. Okay, uh, Ms. Suchins, there are a number of questions. Uh, I don't know how uh, you can, if you can respond to them or Mr. Sacco can respond to those at this time, or if you need additional time, since we are going to continue this public hearing. Um, thank you. I, I think the, um, Dave, I'll defer to you if the, the questions about the, um, if either of the stormwater questions, if you're capable of answering those, if not just, let us know, we can address those at the continuation. I would like to try and address as many of the questions as possible Great. while fresh. Um, uh, several things. First, the way that we're trying to approach the emergency connection to Brightwood Lane is that we are actually lowering the grade of Buckley Road right here. We're bringing it down several feet from its current location in order to soften the transition. It's going to be a roughly 8% uh, transition between the cul-de-sac edge, which will remain unchanged, and the new grade on Buckley. It is flat enough for uh, a vehicle, like a, an emergency vehicle, or even for that matter, a normal car to, to make that grade. Uh, so that's being accomplished not by meeting the existing grade, but by bringing sloping Buckley down into a, a low area right here, 
uh, so that we aren't creating too steep a grade down to Brightwood. Um, it is a feasible grade for, for a vehicle and particularly an emergency vehicle to handle. Um, with regard to the question about swales, uh, the swales are typically a foot and a half deep. They're roughly four feet across at the bottom, about six, uh, seven feet wide across the top. They're designed with a significant amount of volume and they are designed per the town of Brantford regulations to manage a 100 year flow, to manage a 100 year rainstorm, which is a rainstorm, rain coming down at roughly seven inches per hour in intensity. So we are trying to do, we are providing something which based on, on best design practices, the regulations should handle a 100 year flood 100 year, sorry, rainfall event without putting runoff onto the neighbors from the development. And I'd point out that the exact same thing is true along the, the backyards of the Marshall homes. We're providing exactly the same approach to stormwater management along the Marshall side of the site as we are along the Brightwood site. I'd also point out that we're taking a tremendous amount of water out of uh, taking, reducing the risk by taking all of the the roadway runoff and putting it into a, a separate pipe system so that it does not run off toward the swales. We're managing it separately. The homes, each of the homes is equipped with an infiltrator system sized for the home so that runoff from the roof is infiltrated directly into the ground. If those systems overflow, they are equipped to overflow, they would overflow into the swale system. The swale system is designed to accommodate that overflow as well as the rainfall and manage it properly uh, without uh, running, without overflowing uh, onto the adjacent properties. Um, I'd just like to re go back for a second to the, uh, sorry. review the, 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 the overall drainage pattern. Uh, a couple of things. There's a lot of discussion about flooding in Arc Road, in Tabor Road. That flooding is approaching that area from the Branford River upstream. It is not approaching the Branford the, the site from or through our property. And one of the things that we've tried to do is to diminish the portion of the property that is draining to the arc road system. We are trying to alleviate to what extent we can the flooding that occurs down here at Arc and Buckley by taking water that would be flowing north into Arc Road and redirecting it down to the wetland. From where it, the wetland overflows down, eventually reaching Civil Creek and out into the Bradford River. Um, so we're, you know, we're diminishing that area slightly to the extent that we can. Similarly, we, you know, what we're trying to do is diminish the impact on the neighbors because what we're doing is we're regrading the site to drain to predominantly west to east. Right now, there's a hot, there's a ridge down the center of the site. The west side drains west, the east side drains east. By introducing the swale system along the west side of the site, we're intercepting a substantial amount of the rainfall that's hitting and redirecting it away from the neighbors so that, you know, regardless of the impervious area change, the water is being redirected away from the neighboring properties. We're even the, the site is generally grading in a way that diminishes direct runoff, puts it into a structure system that handles it properly. Similarly, over here on the on the Marshall side, we're draining it toward a low-lying area. We're bringing it along the property line and into the tidal wetland rather than pushing it off-site onto the neighboring properties. Um, were, Amy, were there other questions related to storm water that I should touch on? Just looking. Uh, no, I think those were, those were all the ones I had it was about the, the flooding and then the acts, what was happening around the adjacent properties. 
Okay. Great. Um, so with respect to a couple of the other questions that were raised um, by the comment and uh, in, the, um, in the chat, um, number one, under the um, regulations themselves, 73G2 sub one, um, if a neighborhood association is going to maintain the uh, open space, um, the regulation itself requires the establishment of a conservation easement in favor of the town of Brantford. So that would be the intent that this would be the, the property um, that's in the open space would be part of the homeowners association, homeowners association with the conservation easement um, held by the town of Brantford with obviously uh, enforcement abilities um, with respect to um, any potential violations. Um, uh, just, yeah. uh, excuse me, uh, Ms. Sujan, just have you approached the town? Uh, the town has to accept an easement, right? I mean, you, you know, if you talked to anyone about if the town would be willing to accept an easement. I'm sorry, you, you broke up for a second there. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I think w would, would the town have to accept a conservation easement? Well, under its regulations, it says that it's required. So I don't think the town necessarily has an option. It's uh, you, the planning zoning commission can compel the town to accept land <laughs> to accept an easement. <laughs> I, I don't know you're, what you're it's, checking, right. it's it's. I, I will note that the item three is an offer and transfer of the land to the town of Brantford. So clearly, the idea of whether the town is going to take ownership is is different than the intention of a of a conservation easement. Right. Well, I, I'm assuming whether the whether it's an ownership or an easement, it's an interest in land and that there have to be some acceptance by the town. My question, and maybe town wants it, but I just I, I, I don't know if you've checked to see that I'm not sure who who you check with to, to see that they would accept it. That's that's my question. Happy to happy to do that. Right. Um, so then there was also a question about uh uh, deeps review and you know whether they were aware of the stormwater and and um, the remainder of the proposal. Uh, the deep letter itself. This is the second one that you've received. Recognizes um, that the the proposal um, does include fill to raise the home sites above above place. Excuse me, above base flood elevation. Um, and that there are general permits that would be required, um, assuming your approval, um, given the, the size and, and nature of the construction. So certainly um, DEEP, Deep is aware and has copies of all of the plans that were um, uh, submitted to you, I think, including, and, and Mr. Sacco can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure they have the grading plan, which would show um, all the same things that, that we've been talking about uh, tonight. David Thacko, that's correct. They received all of the current plans, including grading and drainage plans. Great. Um, and then there was also a question about uh, both raised in the uh, neighbor's letter and again this evening about um, contamination on surrounding properties. Obviously, we don't have any control over what has happened on surrounding properties, um, but there has been monitoring that uh, test pits dug um, and investigations of the uh, water here, and there's been no contamination that's been that's been located um, on on this property. But as I said, obviously we can't control um, you know some of the some of the issues in the letter raised concerns about other properties that that are outside of our um, uh, ability. And then there were also a couple questions, I think one verbally and then one again in the chat about um, the cul-de-sac and access. Um, we have shown this as gated. There's not an intention. We said that during the last hearing, there's not an intention to connect these um, you know, on a, on a regular basis. It's for emergency access uh, only. And um, as Mr. Sacco outlined, um, the, the grading plan um, and the, the proposal has been reviewed specifically at the request that the, the town planner directed that to the police department and the fire marshal with some specific uh, questions um, to those individuals about the access. You have a copy of their responses 
in the record and there were no concerns as far as, um, you know, uh, from the fire department as to whether their um, uh, uh, apparatus could manipulate or manage all of the, the design, both both the roads and, and that cut through. So I think from a um, public safety standpoint, those, those comments you have from your staff uh, certainly address um, those items. And I think on the same, same note, um, a number of these comments uh, that keep coming up about the design of the stormwater, um, that is the subject of the review by your town engineer. So you have had your own expert um, with the same technical background, review the plans um, that that uh, Mr. Sacco has put together, reviewed those, did not, had made some, frankly, very modest comments. And uh, certainly, I think as, as you know, as I know, uh, we've been doing this long enough, if there's a problem, that's certainly something that comes up in a technical review that if, that if the town engineer thought that this system was poorly designed, um, they, there's usually no hesitation in, in pointing out deficiencies that need to be need to be corrected. That was not the case here. So I think you have a um, your own staff documenting that this is a um, well designed um, and comprehensive system. And then I think the last thing that I wanted to highlight was that there were a couple of comments about uh, both in the letter and about the um, proposal tonight. Uh, or excuse me, in the comments tonight about the overall proposal and it not fitting in with the uh, surrounding area. I think the commission um, should should take into consideration that uh, what, what we're proposing is approximately 12 homes on about six acres. They're about a half an acre. Um, you know, if you, if you did the, the average, they're about a half an acre each. Um, as shown on the plan, the separation distance between these units um, ranges anywhere between um, you know, 28 to 40 feet. I would, you know, when you when you look at the homes on Brightwood Lane, uh, I looked at the distance between number 19 and number 23, number 18 and 22, number 14 and number 10. Those ranges um, are anywhere between 25 and 45 feet. So I think we're, we're right in the same um, window. Certainly there are a couple of houses that are a little bit further apart because of how they're oriented on the lot. Um, but certainly, if you were to look at the R3 regulations, it's a 15-foot uh, side yard, which would obviously result in um, a, a traditional subdivision could have houses that are 30 feet apart, uh, frankly, just as we've shown here. So I think when you look at um, both the size of the lots, the size of the houses, and the, the concepts that are outlined in your R3 regulation, and frankly carried over to the R3 component of the um, open space uh, provision, they are quite frankly very consistent with what you see um, in the surrounding neighborhood. And that's that's why that the, your, your regulations are designed to um, create that consistency. And however, the difference here being that the open space um, concept is designed to make sure that that um, open space is preserved. If you look at the, um, you know, just 15,000 square foot lots, there are um, traditional, <clears throat> excuse me, 15,000 square foot lots, which are consistent with the R3, that uh, 12 houses <clears throat> would mean that we need um, 4.13 uh, 4 acres uh, to be, to have compliant lots, we have six. So I think the idea that this is um, somehow inconsistent with the um, uh, R3 zoning is uh, inconsistent. And I think to the extent that there's this um, frankly convoluted argument about it being an interior lot, I would point out that there are numerous developments in town where um, in a common interest community uh, situation, you have a main entrance and then units located around that. Frankly, um, as I said, the one of our budding properties is the is the Great Oaks development. Um, there are others that you've approved uh, where you know the, the homes are not located um, in a traditional subdivision layout because not everybody wants to um, to live in that style community, and that's why your regulations promote um, different possible layouts, different possible objectives that need to be met, um, whether it's uh, an open space situation here, a traditional subdivision, or 
zones that allow multifamily development because what you want uh, in your town is to provide a diversity of housing. And so the idea that um, you know this is somehow inconsistent with the neighborhood, uh, I think, frankly, is is undermined. You know, the arguments undermined by uh, you know a, a true review of what the characteristics would be and are of your R3, R3 zoning. Um, and I think otherwise, the, the only outs, other outstanding questions, um, I think really relate to uh, things that we've discussed tonight or, or documenting, um, you know, as, as we've noted, whether it's with respect to the um, creation of the homeowners association or um, some of those issues. So if there are any other um, questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'm, I'm aware that you still have plenty of things on the agenda um, and happy to address anything else uh, at the continuation meeting. Uh, thank you, Attorney Sujins. Um, yeah, my, uh, yeah I, I do see a number of hand raised. The, the way we do this is, is we have the applicant go first, then the public portion, and then the applicant gets the last word. However, we are continuing this. So my suggestion is for anyone who has further comments, because I expect that there is disagreement, uh, that you you have a couple of choices. One, you could put it, put it in writing and just submit it to the record since the hearing's open and they can be in the record and the app going to have a chance to respond to those in the public hearing. Or we can uh, you can say them verbally when we continue this. But we do have other items on the agenda that we need to get to. Uh, so with that, this um, are there, is there any from commission members or staff? Are there any uh, questions? Um, and um, the uh, uh, I'll just open up for that. The uh, and and I would say, Attorney Suchins, you can also look at any of the comments in the chat too, and and respond to those as well. Um, so, uh, anything else from the commission members or staff before we uh, continue this matter as a public hearing? Um, Harry Smith, Town Planners, have two quick things. Um, one is I believe uh, there was a commitment to calculate the amount of open space area that is above the mean high water line. Uh, so we'll be looking for that piece of information. And I believe there was a neighbor um, lived uh, off Marshall and um, just in looking at the landscaping plan, I note that although there is quite a bit of buffering landscaping proposed on the property line adjacent to the properties fronting Brightwood, there does not seem to be any proposed um, and I don't know what the characteristics of the land is in that area. It's possible the tidal wetlands creep in there somewhat, but I don't know. But that should be looked at in terms of providing some buffering to those properties as well. Okay, uh, thank you, Harry. Anything else from anyone else? If not, then we are going to uh, continue this matter as a public hearing. We're gonna continue this to our meeting on July 1st at the... Uh, fire station. I think uh, public hearings were, are scheduled uh, at the normal time, seven o'clock. Is that correct, Gary? That is. And just to remind everyone, it's 45 North Main Street in case everyone's forgotten where the fire station is. <laughs> That's correct. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> okay. With that, um, we're going to take a short, uh, let's make it a, uh, make it a 10 minute break and then we'll come back to our regular meeting. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. So then, uh, We'll uh, reconvene, uh, go to item number two of our public hearings, which is <clears throat> DiMartino Development and Construction LLC, uh, DiMartino applicant owner. This is 9612-104 Stony Creek Road, a special exception for grading. Is the applicant ready to proceed with this? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Jim Preddy, Chris Golo Engineering, uh, 420 East Main Street, Brantford, um, representing uh, DiMartino Development. Um, uh, the applicant has bought, um, three parcels that were part of a subdivision from 1973, I believe, um, two half acre lots in the front and an acre lot in the back. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and kind of give you a sense for things. Um, before we get to this, I guess it's probably clearer here. This is, um, Stony Creek Road. These are the three lots, uh, 102, 104, and 96, which is a long, this kind of uh, rectangular piece in the back. Again, this was from a subdivision in 1973, and 
um, as I'm sure everyone's aware, wetlands didn't start till 1975. So none of this was really part of the original subdivision. Um, we had looked at these sites for a number of people over the years at, at um, uh, surveyed them for Ed Marcus, uh, had done a, quite a bit of soil testing for septic opportunities. And when uh, DiMartino approached me about these lots, I uh, convinced him that the right thing to do was to combine them because to build, it would be nearly impossible under today's standards to build houses on these lots. They don't support septics uh, on all three lots. Um, and there's quite a bit of ledge out here in the wetlands. So uh, what we've done is combined all three. And um, I promise that when we go back to live meetings, I'll have my nice colored boards again. <laughs> um, in any event, this is the outline of the, the total area, uh, the darker line. Um, we're proposing to put the house over here. The, the, this was the only area that um, – proved worthy uh, in the eyes of the health department for the septic um, system. Uh, in the back of the lot, there will be a, a rain garden that discharges the roof and the footing drain water toward this wetland area. Um, uh, we have typical erosion controls, uh, construction entrance at the driveway location, stockpile area here, silt fence all around. Uh, we have committed, we have received East Shore approval already. We have received uh, inland wetland approval um, with the concession that we will be adding wood posts at the limit of uh, clearing here with the wet, inland wetland um, markers uh, indicating that, um, you know, past the point there was a wetland area. Uh, the only uh, uh, comment from the town engineer was that, you know, by raising this area for the house and doing our grading that we were creating a little bit of a low spot along the property line. So we've added a, a culvert here so that, uh, or just basically a connecting pipe so that any water does build up along here, does have a way to get out um, basically around a rain garden so it doesn't fill it in. Um, the total uh, site uh, together it becomes a two acre lot instead of two half acre and a one acre lot. <laughs> Um, and that's it. It's a single family home on now a two acre lot. Hi, Chuck Anders here. Thank you, Mr. Pratty. Uh, Evan, did you do the staff report for this? Uh, Evan Browning, assistant town planner. I did. Uh, I think Mr. Pretty covered most of the information from it, but I can go through it. Um, this application is for a special exception for grading. Uh, within 100 feet of an inland wetland, uh, proposes a single family home. Um, they meet the bulk requirements for the R4 district. Uh, they satisfy the general requirements of section 6.8 grading and earth and earth removal activities. Uh, however, staff would like the applicant to clarify if the ledges near the septic system are to remain or are they going to be changed in any way? Uh, no, the, the, well, we can't remove ledge for a septic system. Um, the, per, the health code doesn't allow for that. And if I could just, um, this ledge outcropping that's there, we're, we're gonna be filling a little bit in front of that. We're not gonna be excavating that at all. Um, so in fact, where we, where we placed the house was, there's kind of a lower area here and we're building the house up. So um, the, the plan was to not have to remove any of the rock on the site, but um, you know, things, <laughs> things have a way of changing sometimes, but at this point, there's no planned rock removal. Okay, so they are to remain? Yes. Thank you. Uh, based on the application materials, it appears that the special exception criteria are generally satisfied. Like Mr. Preddy said, uh, they got inland wetland commission approval on May 10th. Um, uh, staff recommends the following conditions prior to the issuance of any zoning authorization or certificate of occupancy uh, or certificate of zoning compliance. Uh, the following shall be addressed to the satisfaction of the zoning enforcement officer, evidence of the legal merger of the three properties, um, erosion control measures, and dust control measures, again, all to the satisfaction of the zoning enforcement officer. Chair Candace, Chair, thank you, Evan. Questions from commission members or staff before we open it up to the public? Hearing none, any member of the public wish to comment? 
Evan, do you see anyone? Evan Brining, Assistant Town Planner, please uh, indicate you'd like to comment using the raise your hand function next to your name on the participant list. I do not see anyone at this time. Okay. Any further uh, comments from uh, Mr. Preddy? Any further comments? No, sir. Thank you for your time. Great. And uh, questions, comments from commission members? Hearing none, then we'll close this matter as a public hearing. It's something I think we can take up later on. Thank you. Bring us into item number three. This is the Brantford Electric Railroad Association 4455 4652 Alex Warfield Road, a special exception for grading. I understand um, we're either going to open this or just table this. What's going on with this one here? Uh, Harrison Town Planner, um, Mr. Freddie, on behalf of the his client has offered a time extension to allow the commission to um, not open the public hearing until July 15th. That will allow some time for them to work on the easement issue. That's outstanding. Okay, so then we can just table that and then the expectation opening this one on our July 15th uh, regular meeting. Exactly. Great, thank you. That brings into item number four, which is Joseph Lepra, 8 Svey Avenue, special exception for two family dwelling. Uh, is the applicant ready to proceed with this one? Yes, sir. You can proceed. Uh, okay, my name is uh, Joe Lapry. I live at uh, 14 Flat Rock Road here in Brantford. Uh, grew up in Brantford. I have a business in Brantford. Um, the property at 8 Fay. Um, we're applying for a special exception for a two family home. The um, site was formerly a knob factory. Uh, it is now, uh, it's an empty lot at this point that we took over. Um, we bought the property in November and it had quite a bit of cease and assist orders on it. We've cleaned the lot. Uh, the lot is mostly paved. Um, the site was actually an old meeting hall also. Um, we're gonna be we're looking to put a uh, duplex that would face the street with a single driveway to allow for parking in the back for a single family structure. Um, yeah, there we go. That's what we needed. So you can see our plan here. Our plan consists of the two family house, the, which would be facing SFE with our driveway access coming in to a single family dwelling, which would be in the rear. Um, we've gone over all the bulk requirements and uh, standards, and we meet all the regulations from the town. Um, we had met with the town center review board and they approved our plan uh, with some minor revisions that we're working on with them directly on. Um, the, um, let me see if I can share this. Um, the maximum height of this structure is, is going to be, uh, 32 feet high. Um, that's at elevation 12. Um, it's well within the standards. Um, you're allowed, uh, we're allowed 40 feet in total height. Um, we still might actually drop the height of the house, um, the, we're working with the insurance company as far as the flood elevation. So there's a possibility we could even be two feet lower. But again, either way, we still are underneath the 40 foot maximum height. Um, the front house, the two family will have a crawl space, which will allow us to, uh, like I said, be above flood. Um, that will have a crawl space and it will have uh, some floodgates in it to allow for the water to run out. And all our mechanicals will be up in the attic and not, not anywhere near the um, flood line. Um, the, any of the, we have the lighting on any of these uh, structures, um, we have full cutoffs uh, to prevent light trespass off the property and will be mounted to the buildings. Uh, as far as the grading and drainage, 
Um, the drainage was designed by Fedis Engineering out of Essex, and they did the calculations to support the uh, one inch rainfall. They have everything pitched with the um, roof drains pitched into that um, rainwater catcher. Uh, yeah, this one, Evan, that, that one's good. So all our water is going to be going into this, um, this rainwater catcher. Um, the, all the parking and, like I said, the roof water will also be going in there. And they did all the calculations and based the sizes on that. Um, the planting for the rain garden, uh, we added a bunch of native species salt tolerant um, that are accepted by the town in order to put in this rain catcher. Um, on this side too, by the rain catcher, we also are gonna be installing um, some arborvitaes so as to block any kind of light from the headlights, from where the cars will be parking to the neighbor. So we kind of figured we would add some arborvitae here to act as a screen. There is presently an existing fence that incorporates three sides of the property. Um, we're going to maintain the property, the uh, fence and replace whatever needs to be replaced. Um, but like I said, right now, 90% of the fence is already in place and our plan is to replace whatever's needed. <clears throat> um, there are additional arborvitaes and plantings you'll see in the rear of the property, which are behind the single family structure to kind of buffer the neighbor on this side, the two neighbors back in the back um, behind a single family structure. Um, we're going to be maintaining in the front, there's an existing sidewalk that goes along Spay, and we're going to be um, maintaining that sidewalk and we're gonna have some uh, native trees for our street trees, which will be out front here. And that should meet our requirements um, from the town. Um, and we have a soil and erosion plan, uh, which shows our entrance. Our entranceway right now is, this area is mostly all paved um, right now. So we're not really going to create much for an anti-tracking pad because, like I said, we're already, this is all asphalt and all paved now. Um, we do have our silt fence and we have a, an area where we figure we could stockpile material in the very back corner during construction if needed. Uh, and that pretty much covers the plan. Ah, sure. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Evan, did you do the report on this one as well? Uh, I did. I would like to go back to one of the previous plans. Uh, like Mr. Laffrey said, this is an application for a two-family dwelling, for which requires a special exception. Additionally, they are proposing a single-family dwelling in the rear uh, above a two-car garage. Uh, this is permitted by right in this district. Um, the applicant meets the bulk requirements of the BR district. Uh, a landscaping plan was provided by the applicant. Uh, this can be found on sheet SP-01. Um, like Mr. Lapley just discussed, the applicant proposes planting on the eastern side of the property line um, uh, and along the western side of the property line. Um, they propose the placement of the driveway uh, so as to access the curb cut, um, so no plantings could be put on this side of the property, but they are proposing a fence or there is an existing fence. Um, staff considers the landscaping requirements to be satisfied. Uh, the applicant also satisfies the off street parking requirements. Um, a copy of the site plan has been given to the town engineering department. Uh, the town engineer has requested additional information and a condition has been added to this staff report to reflect this. Uh, the applicant also appeared before the town center revitalization review board on June 9th. Uh, they were issued a positive recommendation for approval as recommended with the stipulation that the changes discussed at that meeting 
uh, would be added to the architectural designs. Um, per the applicant, uh, they have uh, sent over those plans that include those changes um, to some of the some of the members of that board already. Based on the application materials, it appears that the special exception criteria are generally satisfied. Uh, staff recommends three conditions. Uh, number one, prior to the start of construction, erosion control measures installed to the satisfaction of the zoning enforcement officer. Uh, number two, prior to the start of construction, uh, the applicant shall submit sufficient drainage information to demonstrate the sufficiency of the proposed stormwater management system to the satisfaction of the town engineer or modify the, the design and site plans to accommodate such changes to the stormwater management system uh, design as he may determine to be necessary, as well as our um, lighting uh, condition that we typically use to ensure that the applicant is compliant with our lighting regulations. Chuck Anders Chair, thank you. Thank you, Evan. Do we need to add anything about incorporating the uh, town center re re revisions recommended by town center or is that already in there? Um, I believe all the issues discussed at that meeting that they requested more information on were um, aesthetic or architectural um, features of the project. Right. And, and are uh, they off? What? Uh, Harry Smith Town Planner. It was more of a, uh, they believed it was fine the way it is. And I think what ended up happening at the session was um, it was basically a free advice, if you will, um, for the applicant's designer, house designer. And uh, so uh, they asked, <laughs> they asked for that. And there was some discussion about what could be done to enhance the building a little bit more, though it was found to be um, um, a building that fit into the neighborhood well and met the criteria anyway. So it was more like taking it from, you know, a, a B plus, A minus to an A plus. And okay. it, the applicant looked at wanting to do that, but it was really, really not needed to meet the standards of the town center of uh, village. Okay. It's just a recommendation, not, yeah. not a mandate, right. not a mandate, not a caveat on the approval at all that I remember. Okay. Okay. Questions from uh, commission members or uh, staff before we open up the public. Hearing none. Is there any member of the public that wish to comment? Uh, Evan, I think I see Mr. Moresco. Evan Brining, Assistant Town Planner. It looks like uh, Perry Moresca would like to comment. Hi, um, Perry Moresca. I'm a resident of Brantford, have been for a number of years. Um, also serve on the Economic Development Commission as chairman. Uh, I just want to um, throw out a little character witness uh, in regard to Joe Lepre. Um, very honorable man, businessman in town, very successful. Um, I don't know of any enemies that he has. Um, he's a forever Brantford resident. Uh, respectful of the town and its citizens. I think this proposal is not unlike any of the neighboring properties. Uh, it's certainly an improvement of what is there. Um, there's um, There's been two family homes uh, for a number of years there. And um, I think what he's going to do with the property uh, by constructing new residential buildings for tenants that will likely patronize many of the small merchants in the town center is uh, is a plus and a win for everyone. So thank you very much. Chuck Anders here. Thank you, Mr. Maresca. Uh, Evan, any other members of the public wish to comment? Uh, anyone, Evan Brining, Assistant Town Planner, anyone that would like to comment, please use the raise your hand function next to your name on the participant list. I do not see anyone at this time. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lepper, any further additional comments? I uh, just um, look forward to um, getting started if we get approved and improve the area down there. Great. Thank you so much. Any further questions, comments from commission members or staff? Uh, Harry Smith, Town Planner. Um, I'd raise a question whether any of the commission members are going to recuse themselves from the application. Um, I am. Marcy, speaking. Okay. I just kind of turned the video off and was waiting for an opportunity to say that. Right. Okay. okay. So the record will reflect that uh, Marcy Pelosi has uh, recused herself from this application. Anything, uh, any other comments, questions from commissioners or staff? 
And we, uh, I think we close this matter as public hearing and we can take this up in a little bit. Thank you, Mr. Luck. Thank you. Thank you. And then item number five as our public hearing scheduled is uh, Andrew Renown, applicant KAOP Brantford LLC, special exception or minor modification for upgrade security lighting. Uh, Harry, what's going on with this? Uh, Harry, some town planner. Um... I have received a request from the applicant um, to continue the public hearing um, without testimony to the next meeting of the commission on 7-1. Um, they had a scheduling conflict, so they could not attend tonight. Does the applicant attend to attend the in-person meeting on J July 1? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Okay, then uh, I'll just ask, does any member of the public wish to comment on this item or it is going to be continued? So you, if you're here for that, you can uh, probably save your comments, but I'll just open it up. Evan, do you see anyone? I do not see anyone this time. Evan Brining's assistant town planner. Okay, so then we'll continue item number five uh, as a public hearing to our July 1st meeting at the firehouse on main street so that brings us then that completes our public hearings schedules uh, of our meeting it brings us to our minutes from our june 3rd meeting which were sent out in a packet and if people had a chance to take a look at that and if someone want to make a motion <laughs> you are unmuted joe by you so uh, moves to Accept the minutes. Motion made by Joe to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Is there a second? Massimo Gari seconds. Um, Massimo is Massimo voting. I guess I should ask that. <laughs> um, uh, Joe. Um, I think he might be uh, the next person in line. I believe he is. Okay. So he'd be sitting in for um, our missing Joe Chadwick. Okay, great. Okay, so Massimo seconds. Any further discussion? All in favor? John, are you in favor? John Lust in favor. Joe? Mm -hmm. Bioso? Bioso? Joe Bioso in favor. Marcy? Marcy Pelosi in favor. Massimo? Massimo in favor. And chairs also in favor. So let's bring up the public hearing items that we could handle. The first one was the second uh, item, uh, public hearing number two. That's the Special exception for grading at 96, 102, and 104 Stony Creek Road. Uh, maybe, Evan, you can pull up your resolution. And uh, this seemed to be fairly straightforward uh, application grading just because it was close to wetlands, I believe. That's why they're in front of us. But it's great that they're merging the lots. That's the right thing to do. So, um, any questions or comments from any commission members or staff? Um, Harry Smith, Town Planner. Just um, so the technicality, uh, probably ought to make one B number two and one C number three, um, <laughs> just so they are effective um, outside of the certificate of occupancy or the certificate of zoning compliance process. That just looked like a little typo thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you, Harry. Any other comments? Not does someone want to make a motion to approve these, this application in accordance with the staff recommendations in the memo of uh, June 17th with the amendments that Gary just mentioned, the renumbering 1A and 1B to 2 and 3? John Lusk will make that motion. Okay, motion made by John. Is there a second? You are unmuted. Joe by Uso seconds. Second by Joe. Second by Joe. Any further discussion? further discussion? All in favor. John, are you in favor? In favor. John Lust in favor. Lust in favor. Joe? Joe? Joe in favor. Marcy? Marcy? Marcy's in favor. Massimo? Massimo's in favor. And chair is also in favor. So uh, that application is approved. That brings us then to our fourth public hearing, which is uh, Mr. Lepra's uh, single family and duplex at 8 V Avenue. And uh, maybe you can bring that one up, uh, Evan. Any thoughts, comments? It's uh, 
looks like he's uh, do, doing what's allowed. It's good to have the, uh, the development in the town center. So I'll clean up the site a bit. So looked okay. Um, Harris, what's up? just to note that uh, both Fred and um, Masimo would be uh, voting on this, I believe. Right. Yeah, that's right. Because Marcy's recused herself. Yep. With that said, so we'll make a motion to approve the application with the condition set forth in the staff report. Massimo, we've already approved. Uh, motion made by Massimo. Is there a second? Joe by Yusuf seconds. Second by Joe. Second by Joe. Any further discussion? All in favor. John, you in favor? John left in favor. Fred? Fred? You are unmuted. Where's Fred? Where's Fred? Fred, uh, Fred is uh, muted. Fred is muted. Fred, you ought to be able to mute yourself, to mute hopefully. yourself hopefully. Ah, ah. Maybe. Maybe. I got it. I got it. I'm good. 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 <laughs> so, uh, Fred, that's a, a vote in favor, yes? In favor? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Joe Vallejo? Joe Vallejo? Joe Vallejo in favor. Massimo? Massimo? Massimo Ligori in favor. And chairs also in favor. So, that application is approved. Then that uh, brings us now to correspondence. Any correspondence, Harry? Uh, Harry's been town planner. No, there's no new correspondence. Okay, excellent. Let's go to old business. I have number one is uh, I had Sammy Old Barons Inc. at 49 Leeds Island Road, a special exception. Understand uh, that's uh, we're, we're going to table this one that's expanding the convenience store. Is that correct? Uh, Harry Smith Town Planner, yes, that's correct. We're looking at probably a hearing date of the 15th because that will be the last opportunity before the 65 days expire. Okay, so we'll table that one. Item number two, which is uh, Brenna Begley, RGA Realty Management, 53747 Main Street, a site plan for a skin care spa. Uh, is the uh, applicant ready to proceed with this one? Yes, sir. You can proceed. All right, uh, Brenna Begley, I am a Brantford resident, 43 Briarwood Lane in Brantford. Um, thank you for taking the time to hear my application. Um, pretty simple, I am requesting a site plan approval as I am changing the previous um, purpose of the space from retail to personal service. Um, the space was previously occupied by a bridal boutique and then most recently was the warehouse for FLB Linen. Um, I'm proposing non-structural and non-permanent changes to the interior only. The only exterior changes will be signage. Um, I am also requesting um, a site plan waiver as none of the changes will be structural um, structural or permanent. Uh, Chuck Anderson, thank you, Ms. Bagley. Tell us a little bit about your business. Uh, do some free promotion for yourself here. Yes, that sounds good. So um, I'm an esthetician, so I specialize in skincare. Um, so I do facials, back treatments, chemical peels, that kind of thing. Um, and basically, I'm just trying to um, change the in interior of the location to kind of fit my needs. So I'm building three treatment rooms and then um, on non-loan bearing walls. And then I will be adding sinks and electrical per health department requirements. Sounds, that sounds very nice. Thank you. Uh, Evan, you, uh, did you do the staff report on this one? Uh, yes. Am I on mute? Yeah. Evan Brining, assistant town planner. Uh, like Ms. Beglia just told us, uh, they proposed to change the use from retail to personal services. Um, they proposed to occupy a space facing Main Street. Uh, uh, no exterior changes are proposed. Um, the applicant does not propose any exterior changes. Therefore, the pre-existing non-conforming status can continue in relation to the bulk requirements of the BR district. Uh, the previous use of the unit was retail, which requires the same number of parking spaces, spaces as the proposed unit. Uh, no earth, earth disturbance is proposed. No lighting plan was provided. Um, the applicant appeared before the Town Center Revitalization Review Board on June 9th. The board issued a positive positive recommendation with the condition that the signage permit and details when they're received by staff uh, be sent over to that board. 
Um, staff recommends two conditions, no additional signage or new or replacement lighting shall be installed without planning or, planning or zoning commission approval uh, or that of its staff. And two, the approved signage shall be, shall be sent to the Town Center Revitalization Review Board for comment. Um, and uh, up on the screen now is what Brenna and her father had supplied for uh, the interior plans of the unit they will occupy. Thank you, Evan. Uh, questions or comments from commission members? Okay, uh, that, that seems fairly straightforward. This is, uh, I remember when the bridal shop was there and it's, I think you've got a, uh, you've got, some, got the uh, sandwich shop next door. So it's always good to have some businesses and fill vacancies, mm -hmm. so that's great. Uh, any, uh, if there are no questions from uh, commission members, does someone want to make a motion to approve the application with the two conditions? I think uh, the staff report just said one that was sent out, but you added the approving of the sign. Is that correct, Evan? I did, and let me bring it up. Oh, look at that. I, I, I think the... Uh, you have signage and there was two though, right? Uh, there was. Uh, the other condition was uh, the approved signage. I'm sorry. Uh, the approved signage shall be sent to the town center review board for comment. Okay. That said, does uh, someone want to make a motion to approve the application with the uh, two conditions, the one in the staff report and the additional one that just mentioned by Evan? Chuck, Federico, who's up? Uh, for um, the fifth member of the commission, voting uh, member. Harry Smith, town planner. I believe it's Mazamo. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Marcy Pelosi will make that motion as presented. Okay. Marcy makes a motion to approve with the two conditions. Is there a second? Massimo Ligori seconds. Massimo seconds. Any further discussion? All in favor, John? John Lust in favor. In favor. Joe Vallejo. Joe Vallejo. Joe, a favor. Marcy? Marcy. Marcy's in favor. Marcy's in favor. Massimo? Massimo? In favor. And chair is also in favor, so uh, you're approved, and good luck. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. You bet. Thank you. Brings in a new business. We have item number one of new business is a site plan, a coastal site plan. I understand this just came in the door. Is that correct, Harry? So you want us to table this one? Uh, Harry Smith, town planner. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so we'll table item number one. Item number two, basically the same thing, right? A special exception, single family dwelling. That's also just came in. Uh, Harry Smith, town planner again. Yes, get correct again. Okay, so we'll table item number two. Brings us then to other business. Under one, we have the time extension request for the uh, section 6.8 grading approval for 58 East Industrial Drive. I think that, we, that was on the agenda for the last meeting. And want to check with the applicants. So, do you have a recommendation for that one? Yes. Uh, Harry Smith, town planner, um, have discussed with the applicant um, uh, bringing the soil and erosion control measures back. Um, they've been kind of overwhelmed by some of the sedimentation occurring on the site. Um, discussed the need to keep moving on with the project. The applicant or the property owner said to me that. A lot of the grading they're doing is to uh, towards establishing the correct grades that are approved in the site plan and the special exception. Um, I'd recommend another six months just so the commission has opportunity to check in um, since there's a lot of activity occurring out there and, and frankly, not all of it's related to re developing the property. So, uh, you know, I, it's a busy time and I know the uh, person running, owning the property and running the business out there is uh, awfully busy with the construction, but uh, um I think it'd be appropriate to check in another six months and with the understanding you have additional six months after that. Okay. Okay. So the recommendation is to grant a six month extension uh, for the uh, completion of the grading approval, just so we can check at the end of that to make sure that the solar roid and other materials have been maintained. Yes. So I want to make that. And so I want to make that motion. John Lust, I'll make that motion. Okay, motion made by John. Is there a second? You are unmuted. Joe Bayuso seconds. Second by Joe. Further discussion? Further discussion? 
All in favor, John? All in favor, John? John left in favor. Go, go. Go in favor. Marcy? Marcy? Marcy's in favor. Massimo? Massimo? Massimo, you're muted. Okay. Yep. Massimo in favor. Okay. Thanks, Massimo. And chair is also in favor. So uh, that six month extension is granted. I have number two, a bond establishment for 149 Cherry Hill Road. What's that about? Um, Gary, do you know do you know what the bond extension is about? It's a bond establishment. Uh, this is one of the lots from the um, uh, division of the Cosgrove property on the north side of uh, Todd's Hill Road. And it goes around the corner of Cherry Hill Road. That's why it's Cherry Hill Road address. I think Evan has hopefully had an opportunity to take a look at this. So I'm going to defer to him. Uh, for the uh, I believe the bond was, or Evan Browning, assistant town planner. I believe the bond was to uh, see or lay down topsoil, seed the property, and uh, a driveway apron as well. And how much? Yeah, how much? <laughs> Three thousand nine hundred and thirty-five. Three thousand nine hundred and sixty-five. Okay. okay. Thanks, Evan. Any questions? Not someone to make a motion to establish a bond for uh, three thousand nine hundred sixty-five dollars for the topsoil and apron work for one forty-nine Cherry Hill. Joe Vayuso approves. Motion made by Joe. Is there a second? Is there a second? John Lust, second. Second, second. second by John. Second Further by discussion? John. Further discussion. All in favor, John. In favor, John. John Lust in favor. Go. Go. Joe in favor. Marcy. Marcy. Marcy's in favor. Marcy's in favor. Massimo. Massimo. Massimo's in favor. Massimo's in favor. Pierre's also in favor. That brings us then to our planner's report. What's going on here? Um, Harry Smith Town Planner again. Um, I'll make two quick announcements. One is that um, we have selected a consultant um, for the affordable housing plan. And that person is Glenn Schroll or Planner Metrics. Uh, so working out details of a contract um, and we'll be uh, giving you more information at the next meeting about moving forward with that. Um, and there is also quite a bit to discuss, but I'm not proposing that we do it tonight about legislation that has come out of uh, Hartford uh, that is going to affect us, how we do business and our regulations. Um, one being a uh, provision to establish accessory apartments as of right. Uh, there is an opt out as part of that legislation. Uh, there is also um, some uh, parking standards that have been promulgated again with an opt out provision. Um, and there have been some uh, changes to the use of uh, what's, I guess, termed community character um, in zoning regulations. That, those term that terminology has been uh, eliminated from the statute and replaced with site-specific characteristics, I believe, is the term. Um, so there's a bunch of other things going on um, and things that have, you know, waiting for the dust to settle, and we're going to need a little bit of time to review all the legislation as it's been finalized and come back and... Uh, and uh, start a conversation about where to move with some of that stuff. Um, I'd also like to propose that the commission consider um, adding a other business item number four would be the appointment of a new zoning enforcement officer. The town has hired a gentleman named Dylan uh, Willette, um, who is uh, most recently the zoning enforcement officer in Woodbury. Uh, he'll be starting next Monday. Um, Mr. John Rosatsky, who has been acting as an interim zoning enforcement officer, along with um, Dan Brennan, um, quietly in the wings at his home, um, processing permits, um, has been smoothing the transition over. Uh, we're so planning on keeping John Rosatsky on board um, with the end of the fiscal year. Um, our little bit of excess salary money is going away. That's what we've been using to pay both uh, Dan Brennan He's been doing about maybe five, six hours a week, and as well as uh, um, uh, Kate. Um, I'm already forgetting her last name. <laughs> Piazza. Piazza. <laughs> um, who have both been um, in the wings doing some extra work for us during our uh, staff transitions here. And um, I'd just like to wish both of them uh, um, uh, success in their future endeavors. And hopefully, uh, Commissioner Juan expressed some sentiments of gratitude and appreciation. Because I think it's been very helpful to us that they both uh, 
uh, been continuing on and trying to do what they can to uh, uh, keep us going here. Uh, uh, check in as chair. Well, certainly we echo those concerns of gratitude, those sentiments of gratitude and appreciation for Kate and uh, my, um, I, them both helping us out and uh, when we needed it. So that's appreciated. And also, so then do we want to add to the, someone make a motion to add to the agenda, the appointment of our new zoning enforcement officer, Daniel Dylan Willett as our new zoning enforcement officer. So I want to move to add that to the agenda. You are unmuted. Oh, by you, so so moves. Moves, okay. Motion to add the agenda. Joe's made the motion. Is there a second? Is there a second? John must will second that. Second by John. Further discussion, all in favor, John? John must in favor. In favor. Joe? Joe. Joe in favor. Marcy? Marcy's in favor. Massimo? Massimo. Massimo's in favor. And Chair is also in favor, so. And I guess the next motion should be, is there uh, a motion to appoint Dylan with that as our uh, new uh, zoning enforcement officer? So I want to make that motion. Unmuted. Marcy will make that motion. Make that motion. Oh, motion by Marcy. Is there a second? Massimo will go second. Second by, second by Massimo. Further discussion? All in favor, John. John. John must in favor. Joe. Joe. Joe in favor. Marcy. Marcy's in favor. Massimo. Massimo. Massimo's in favor. Cheers also in favor. What else you got, Harry? That is all I have. Thank you. Okay. Anything? Anyone else? Anything? I'll uh, make a motion to to uh, adjourn. Adjourn. <laughs> okay. Motion to adjourn by Marcy. Adjourn by Marcy. There's a second. There's a second. Joe, by you so seconds. Second by Joe. For the discussion, by and, uh, are you in favor of adjourning, John? John. John must in favor. Joe. Joe. Joe in favor. Marcy. Marcy. Marcy's in favor. He's in favor. Massimo. Massimo. Massimo's in favor. Harris also in favor. So, see everyone in person in a couple of weeks. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. 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 This program was brought to you in part through the support of the Town of Brantford. Watch town meetings and other videos on demand at BrantfordTV.org.